Medfield TV, community shows. All right, welcome uh, to the Board of Selectmen meeting for July 31st, 2018. As always, this meeting is being recorded, so don't say anything you don't want to be heard by uh, the tens of people watching. Um, <laughs> we will begin uh, by taking a moment of appreciation uh, for our troops serving the Middle East and around the world. Uh, thank you. Uh, at the conclusion of tonight's meeting, we will have an executive session for the purpose of discussing potential litigation, strategy for collective bargaining, and strategy for employment negotiations with non-union personnel. The open session will not resume after the conclusion of the executive session. Uh, just for those uh, for planning purposes, here's how we're going to do it. Uh, our first two appointments will be with Chief Meany and uh, Deputy Chief Will Helmy. Uh, we'll then uh, cover the Adam Street parking issue, Mr. Hallisey, and then the Senior Housing Overlay District. So that's <laughs> our order of operations <coughs> so far. So begin with uh, Chief Meany. Thank you. <coughs> Most likely your last visit with us as the Chief of Police in Medfield. So. It, it it Welcome. most likely is. So he hello and goodbye, I guess. So I, I, I suppose the good thing would be if this is the last. <laughs> if I have to come before you again before Friday at 0800, it probably won't be something good. So, well. you know, yes. And, and I notice no one's very emotional about this, and that's appropriate. Um, so. We, we, can, we, can, we can. No, that's okay. Give us, okay. Give us a minute, Chief. Uh, I, I, I don't see any Kleenex readily available, so let's not, let's, you know. I have some. No. <laughs> You might need it as the meeting goes on, who knows. <laughs> so what I have is a request that, um, I'm sure everybody remembers Sergeant Dan McCarthy, who was killed in the line of duty directing traffic on 109 up in Millis uh, back on September 21st in 2000. So in May, uh, his widow Kim contacted Deputy Chief uh, Will Helmy and had a very, good thought, which is, you've got a new public safety building, wouldn't it be nice if you had something out there for Dan? And it seemed like a very reasonable idea to us. So uh, the union started working on, you know, some issues with it. Uh, what we did is we, you know, not standing in her shoes and not even trying to, I said, what would you like? Why don't you tell us what you'd like? And if it seems reasonable, okay. So we went to the Permanent Building Committee back in June, and the Permanent Building Committee um, was favorable towards it and favorable towards considering uh, funding it, but they thought it appropriate, uh, very correctly, to come to you folks and say, this is what we'd like to do, and what do you folks think? So um, what we have is I'll show you I got a couple of pictures of a design and this was done by Kim and her family and the children it's what they would like and it is what the uh, state police uses in front of their barracks for uh, troopers killed in the line of duty and where they will ask to sign it's about three feet tall um, and we're going to ask the highway department to help us with the uh, below grade type of um, type of structure, which is a concrete pad. Uh, it's, yeah, as I said, it's approximately three feet tall. I mentioned it to Chief Carrico, just to see if we wanted to do something on a larger scale. And the decision, the, you know, the discussion was, let's just do this, uh, because he is the only uh, public safety officer fire or police or EMS killed in the line of duty in Medfield. And it'd be fine if it stays just like that and nothing else happens. And we're thinking as you walk out the front door off of the left-hand side somewhere, we have a bench out there that is uh, that has Robert Naughton's name on it down by the street. There's also um, Coleman Hogan Square, one of the earlier police chiefs, about four or five, five, five or six chiefs back from me. So. This is what we've come up with. This is actually what uh, Kim has come up with. So I present it to you folks to see if this is something that you would think is appropriate and would allow us to do. And I'm happy to answer any questions. And the, the deputy was very good friends with 
with Kim and and Dan and the family, so he can have a little bit more insight if you wanted to, you know, ask him any questions also. So that is that is what I have for a request. Okay. Pete. I, I think it's a, an excellent idea to somehow memorialize Sergeant McCarthy. Um, I remember when he came and, and uh, uh, was competing to be promoted. I remember playing softball with him in a softball game and, uh, and just seeing how he interacted with his daughter, um, who was maybe 13 or something at the time. Uh, well, and. Uh, Yep, and I've never seen so many police as at his funeral um, at one point, at one time. It was just remarkable, the, uh, the turnout for his uh, funeral. Uh, so I think it would be, I think it'd be an excellent thing for the town to do. I think, especially if it's his family that thinks this is what they'd like to see done. It's we, we put it right in her court and said, Kim, you and your family, you decide what you'd like. So this is nothing from the mind of a barber John this is what the family would like to see mm -hmm. I agree yeah I have no I have no questions great I assume we'll have someone will be commissioned to make it yes and we've got that sorted already right yeah yeah is it just that you need us to approve the concept or approving funding or no just if you could just to... approve the concept the permanent building committee is going to consider funding the project okay but we want to make sure that you folks were okay with this you need an official motion or, or just a general consensus? I, if you'd like to, that'd be fine. Official motion, okay. Move that we approve the installation of a monument for Sergeant McCarthy in the front of the public safety building. Second. All in favor? Aye. Yep. There you go. Thank right. you very much. That's great. And then uh, item number two for the day. Um, we have to. Want me to stay up there or want him up? There? Well, I think we should probably <laughs> have both of we should have both of you up okay. there. Let's give the deputy okay. chief up there. Um, with uh, Chief Meany's last day on is this Friday so as of 8 o'clock on Friday morning he'll no longer be the police chief and be into a well-deserved retirement as just another resident of the town of Medfield like the rest of us um, and so uh, I think we discussed this at a previous meeting but it obviously I think makes sense to me and, and to, to the rest of the board to appoint Deputy Chief Wilhelmy as the acting chief of police effective at 8 o'clock on Friday morning I don't really have any questions or comments. Do you have any questions or comments? Uh, no, no. Or? Just thank you for being willing to take on the job and wishing you the best of luck as you take over from Chief Meany. And thanks to Chief Meany for everything he's done over the years. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Okay. Any questions for us? I don't. I, I, I can't promise I'll keep up his pace, but I'll, I'll try. <laughs> um, I won't disappoint you. I'll promise you that. The bagpipe lessons start on Saturday. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Okay, that's, that's an excellent point. You know, okay. Um, don't they do the kilt fitting first? <laughs> we, we can I want a motion from the can club. Pull it off. <laughs> we can discuss this later probably. <laughs> Not much later. <laughs> uh, do we have a motion? about the kill or, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll see about that i'm happy to <laughs> are, are we did we already approve it or we are we, we, have, we have to officially approve okay it. Uh, i move that we uh approve uh deputy chief will help me and his acting chief uh, as of eight o'clock on friday morning second all in favor aye, aye. thank you thank you thank congratulations you. thank you thank you very much oh here we go mm -hmm. photo op oh I like that handshake. Want to try that? All right. Oh. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, next item uh, Adam Street Parking, Russ Hallisey. <clears throat> well, let me be the first to uh, congratulate our new acting chief. Uh, Mr. Chairman and fellow board members, uh, thank you for having me tonight. So I represent Marcia, Marcia Testa and GK, GK Development Corporation. Uh, they're looking to acquire the property at 108 Adams Street. Uh, it's under purchase and sale agreement. Uh, it's subject to getting a special permit, which we are uh, have an application in, and we're going to be meeting uh, with the uh, with the. Uh, um, uh, board of, uh, board of uh, Zoning Appeals uh, on March 8th. Uh, 
Uh, but prior to that, uh, when? August. I'm sorry, August 8th. What did I say? March. 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 You're either very early or very late. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we need to get way ahead of it. <laughs> so August 8th, and uh, it came across, uh, you know, that uh, we found out that the uh, actual parking spaces that are located on Adams Street, right in front of the uh, entrance to the building, actually are located on the town uh, layout of that street. And so uh, I guess this first became apparent when we went forward with this uh, permitting process. You know, the, the prior owners, uh, you know, never had occasion uh, to, to come uh, before us. So this was kind of a, 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 an awakening of everybody. So uh, we were advised uh, by town council that the uh, appropriate step would be to come before the board uh, and ask for permission to continue to use these spaces uh, by way of a license. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to, to visit the property or see it uh, recently, uh, but when you go and look at the property and drive by, you have no idea that the uh, parking spaces are in the, in the so-called street. You know, the pavement comes up to that, as often happens, most ha mostly happens. The pavement comes out to some part, and then after that is the remainder of the town layout, which many people who, you know, on their street, they don't realize they don't own that street and their grass is growing up to it. Well, that was the same thing with this. But as you drive by this one, you wouldn't really realize with the layout of the vegetation and where the street is, uh, you know, it, it wouldn't be apparent that it's in the town layout. Um, I provided a, uh, a copy of the recorded plan uh, for your benefit. I hope, oh, thank you all got it. And so you can see uh, where they're actually located. Uh, they've been they're drawn out. Um, so we're here uh, today to uh, ask for permission by way of a license, which would be a document uh, worked out with town council that would be recorded at the registry of deed. Uh, it would not be recorded. It won't be recorded? Not as a license. OK. <clears throat> but we would have a document in hand as, as the agreement. And like licenses go, as you probably know, uh, they're not necessarily totally permanent in nature. They're kind of gratuitous. That if any time the board decides that they don't want the license to continue for whatever reason, and it could be like maybe expanding the roadway or whatever at that corner, um, it is something that you know can be revoked. Uh, you know, at will by the uh, by the board. So, and, and we understand that we we're going into this transaction with that understanding. And if that worst case scenario should ever happen, we'll just have to make other arrangements. All right. Pete, is this parking that is uh, headed face into the building? Yes. Yeah, that's what I remembered the parking was there. And I think there's about seven spaces there. It was drawn out as seven, and I don't never do really measure, but. How much is, is the, are the parking spaces all the towns, or is it just half of the parking spaces, or how much? It shows on the plan. I couldn't tell from looking so, at it. Yeah, it shows on the plan that they're, except for maybe a foot or so, near the building, it looks like they're pretty much all on, ta on the, uh, in the layout. Actually, my first recommendation was to consult with the, with the uh, police department and confirm that it is not a traffic or safety issue as a result of this. Right, if so if you're even considering granting a license. So I don't know if you had a chance to talk to the chief uh, before this tonight's meeting. Uh, I'm glad to see that he was here tonight. Uh, he did uh, communicate with Sarah, uh, the town planner, uh, in the course of this uh, process. And he had sent an email indicating that there was, and I'll let him speak for himself tonight. All right, chief, you're back. Can we get, a, get you a microphone or have you come to the podium? Go oh, right back up there, yeah? I thought you just left. <laughs> Does this count as that return you were hoping to get? <laughs> I, I think we'll consider this all just one meeting, so this is just part and parcel, so if there are other issues, I'm willing to speak. So I had a discussion with Sarah, and I think I actually sent her an email saying that, to my knowledge, we've not had any issues down there with the parking, uh, with people backing out onto the street, with other folks then, you know, with the cars being too far into the street and creating a hazard, and it was a fairly busy place, Ace and Acme, right across the road from them. We've never, we've not had any negative interactions that I can come up with. So when it first was brought to my attention, this, my impression was, oh, 
another layout that, you know, it, it goes a little further than probably most people think, which is something that happens quite often around any town. But I don't really particularly see a problem with their having those parking spaces there, from my point of view. Chief, what about the uh, the sight distances and the distance from the, cr the car to making a right turn off of Adams Street? Is that all safe? Is that all okay? It, yeah, when you take the right uh, right turn and you start up the hill. Off of West Mill, I mean. Yep, somebody coming right by the railroad tracks. Take the turn by the tracks and yep. come up the hill to go towards Floyd and Glen. That's when they wouldn't see the cars backing out. Right. But that um, works in your mind? You know, we still have not had much issue there and I think was there a photographer studio down there there was, there was. yeah um, people coming and going and we didn't have issues now this is not to say that we won't have one tomorrow at 10 17 in the morning now that I've <laughs> stood up here and spoken but it's not something that I that I immediately clutch my chest over and say oh here's our chance to get rid of those parking spaces and let's never let anybody park there again that's not my opinion Yes. So my I, uh, first question was: There already a license for these before? So how, did, how, how did how did these come to be put into use as? We were just doing it, apparently. We just did it. Yep. And what is the significance of just continuing on the way that it's been versus putting a license in place? Well, uh, if okay. I could answer Mark, that, Mark. If, Mark. What? May I answer? I'd probably yes. like to hear both of your answers, okay. actually. Okay. But, my opinion is that I'm going to have to answer to the zoning board when they ask me for how many parking spaces do you have available, mm -hmm. and I'm going to want to rely on those spaces. And now that we know that they're not on, owned by ours, we need some authority, and I'd rather ask for it before I get to the zoning board okay. so that I would be able to tell them that okay. we have the right to use them. Is there any legal significance between one or the other? Obviously, a license, although it is revocable, is, is at least permission to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the model would be what we did with the parking lot over here. But on the other hand, we got some benefit out of that, too. It was a, it was a, uh, he, he built out some of that, so there was some advantage to the town. It's up to you what you want to do. We have, we have allowed uh, the fence over here at the condos is impinging in the right of way. We have some sprinkler heads in a, in a middle strip. That, so we have, on occasion, allowed lesser intrusions. I, I just wanted to know how it came about that we didn't do it in the past and we are doing it now. I, I, I drive that fairly frequently and I've never, I wouldn't have even realized there were seven spots there probably. So. Well, like I, like I had said earlier, there was no occasion to have to come before the town boards for any particular permission for anything and so it never, it never came yeah. up. If I were buying the property, I'd feel probably a little more secure about it if I knew that I was on the right side of the town for something like this. So, I, I guess my next question would be for maybe for Sarah. If, if someone were permitting this use at that site, what would be the distance from the, uh, the corner that one would allow a curb cut? Oh, actually, that's a great question. It came up just the other day. Uh, I think it was 150 feet for a to new... To the middle of the intersection. Yeah, for a new curb cut. I don't know the distance, um, but this would be considered a pre-existing nonconformity. Um, the whole lot, it's a very small lot. Um, in general, is this on? Is it okay? <laughs> Feels very quiet. Um, so, um, and like Russ said, it's going before the ZBA for a full review. Um, in a couple of weeks and I think it's very necessary for them to have the benefit of a license some permission for them to use count this space towards their parking requirement otherwise um, it would impact the other uses on the lot they're gonna have to go to the planning board for site plan too no uh, when the concept was originally proposed um, back in May uh, the propose or uh, the prospective buyer indicated that she might actually want to build another building um, in addition to what's there so it that would have required site plan approval by the planning board in addition to the use special permit by the zoning board of appeals since it's just uh, the reuse of existing building uh, no changes to the footprint um, and uh, on the existing lot then it just requires the special permit what's the purpose what's the purpose 
I'm sorry. The what are they going to do with the you? property? Oh, um, they're. Russ can speak to this, but it's for the special permits for the uh, outdoor storage of construction equipment and supplies. So it's a contracting, con con just the equipment, the equipment. Like okay. Okay. You know, heavy kind of machinery. Yeah. The, co the company is a uh, real estate commercial development company, and so they have the need for additional parking facilities uh, for some of their vehicles. So it's not another Starbucks or McDonald's. No, and then the uh, office itself, and I have uh, their, their son here today, Gerard, he could uh, speak to this, but they indicated to uh, me that uh, they're going to uh, just use it really for their own office space uh, as a, you know, the development company on oh, occasion. Hello. They have other space in there. That does bring up a point, though, <coughs> as to what types of vehicles are going to be permitted to park in those spaces. I would submit that probably it should only be automobiles. I was actually just going to speak to that. There's a an entrance along the tracks that comes out onto West Mill Street that I suspect would be primarily used for the larger vehicles. Right. None of the none of the construction equipment is in, is intended for any of these uh, six or seven spots. Those will just be uh, you know passenger automobiles, maybe a van, that kind of thing. But just, just the uh, cars. And, yeah. and we, so I, I guess if it did become a problem, <coughs> well, with, then we'd be able to, we'd revoke the license if it became a problem. Well, the starting point is the license. Yeah. My, uh, my recommendation would be simply to park automobiles there, yeah. period. Yeah. Yep. That, and Russ, that works okay? Yes, that was the only thought we had was, was automobiles. That's all that could fit there. I, I have no, Gus asked my only question, so any more questions? I had a question for uh, Mark, whether, uh, is it something that you recommend to the board to do or not? We have had a, you know, we have protections in the agreements we've done for insurance and indemnity and that sort of thing, so uh, I think you have to take each case on its merits and make it, and balance it, because I don't think it's something you would want to do on a widespread basis. I do it very selectively. It's a reuse of the property. It is a tight lot. It's being put back on the tax rolls or continued on the tax rolls, whatever. So we certainly want to encourage this type of business in Medfield. So I, I, I think it's a good idea. It hasn't been a problem for the 50 or so years that cars have been parked there. You know, we can. Take that as a sufficient sample size that we'll probably figure it out and it's a problem we can take care of it. So do we have a motion from the clerk? I move that we uh, approve the issuance of a license to uh, be negotiated by our town council to authorize the continued use of those seven parking spaces for automobiles. Only. Uh, only. Second. So we'll have to come back for signature anyways. Do you want to make it passenger vehicle? Well, do we want pickup trucks? Well, I mean, to me, if it can fit yeah. in a spot. Yeah. It is. It's if an employee's driving there and parking. That's what it's for. It's not for parking a backhoe. No, that's right. But right, but I don't even know if it if it can handle a pickup truck, given the fact that it's jutting out into Adam Street. Well, it's got to, it's got to say a vehicle that will fit in the space without we'll go with that. onto the street. Yeah, that makes sense. Sometimes people go with vehicle weight when they're trying to differentiate between the passenger vehicles and contractors' trucks. I think as long as it fits in the spot and doesn't encroach in the street, right? Does that work for you? If it's not in the street, yeah. 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 Well, well, if you'd like your pet peeve memorialized, you'll have to get a microphone, Dave. <laughs> is is the spaces are they deep enough to accommodate? No, my like a pickup my truck can be off the right of way. Is it so? You don't know. My pet peeve in parking lots is having pickup trucks parked beside me in my car and being unable to see what I'm backing out into. And here is a case where a pickup truck could obstruct somebody coming out. I would not want to park between pickup trucks on a public street like that. And I think it's a, it's a legitimate safety issue. I, I have another way of doing it rather than gross vehicle weight, and that would be for somebody to determine the uh, acceptable depth of the lot and we can put up a limitation on the length of the vehicle. We can work on that this week, Russ and I. <laughs> I have tape Field trip, field trip. <laughs>
I guess motion. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's see. So uh, I, I move that we uh, approve the issuance of a license to be uh, developed by the town council uh, with appropriate restrictions in terms of what vehicles can be parked on that lot, uh, pr presumably at this point in terms of the length of the vehicle that may be parked there. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Russ. Anything else? Great. Thank you. So it helps me a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you. We'll be in touch, Mark. All right. All right. I'll start looking in. All right. Next item, uh, the Senior Housing Overlay District Draft. Uh, Courtney or Sarah, who, who will be? I'll let Courtney speak to it off, first. So. <laughs> Courtney Starling, Community Opportunities Group, Housi Towns Affordable Housing Consultants. You're going to go up to the microphone or you're going to get the microphone? All right. I'll stay seated. All right. My favorite seat in the house. <laughs> Um, we came to see you not that long ago to talk about um, the first iteration of this and we subsequently went to see the planning board if I'm not mistaken and have now uh, come back with um, a, a rendition that is more or less similar but sought to uh, address some issues with clarity for um, in one case um, which set of regulations and special permit criteria were applicable. Um, and in some other cases, um, just minor, uh, minor alterations, um, either to um, create more consistency with the existing bylaws definitions, like for floor area, um, and uh, where there might be some um, issues in there or loopholes. Uh, one of the things that was changed more significantly is the density of the units was reduced and the minimum lot size uh, for the uh, smallest was um, the smallest development which would be cottages was raised from two acres to three acres um, after getting the site plan from Hinckley and discovering what we can do and uh, make sure that the development potential under this bylaw matches uh, more or less the program that's been in place since discussion with the master plan uh, for the hospital site. Um, there, uh, there, you know, again, there's minor dimensional changes, and then there's some that are more uh, significant for the request of the planning board. Um, they didn't like to see two parking spaces per unit. Um, I'd always like to put in one. I think for the, I think 1.5 is probably going to be slightly more saleable to um, the seniors, uh, just for whatever it's worth. One is not necessarily what they've been asking for. <laughs> and so I do want to remain consistent uh, somewhat because generally if you don't uh, require the parking, uh, people are not going to build it for fun because it costs money. Um, so that were, those were the main changes. Um, in addition, I've submitted a map where, um, where as written, uh, this bylaw could potentially apply. Um, one of the things, though, that should be noted is that many of these lots are already restricted in terms of development potential, whether they are the town's open space, ConCom owns a few. Uh, some of these have conservation restrictions from subdivisions. Uh, so there's kind of a mix in here, and I think the actual number is, um, while we have purple lighting up over the map, I think the actual number is fairly low and for um, the most part for this bylaw to be um, to be used, particularly on the sites that we have in mind, a developer would really need to act in partnership with the town, particularly because um, most of the prime sites are underserved by infrastructure. And so like with the Hinkley, for example, right now it lacks a public way, it lacks gas, and it lacks um, sewer, and it lacks water, and so we have some minor problems with how attractive that site is. <laughs> um, and so part of this is kind of to incentivize some of those investments to be made, as I'm not imagining that the the town of Medfield is looking to um, take on that kind of debt at this point in time for those particular infrastructure projects. Uh, so the idea somewhat is that if we can give um, at least enough uh, development potential, uh, particularly at Hinkley, that we can um, facilitate the site to be developed for senior housing and also get some infrastructure in there without the town paying for it, more or less. <laughs> I've got goals, and those are the goals. <laughs> I had a couple, uh, uh, well, a general question first. Uh, yes. We didn't get the plan uh, circulated to oh, us. Oh, I have extras. Oh, good, excellent. That takes care of that. Um, Sarah's got a lovelier version where she marked up what everything is. I don't, I get to know what I'm going to not post it online, but. Thank you. Um, well, that would help. <laughs> and then uh, I just had a couple of very specific questions or thoughts in terms okay. of things like uh, in, in your definitions, the cottages um, are 2,400 square feet. Um, so to me, that's a two-story uh, building. Um, 
The reason that we get and there it's kind is of a large cottage. I guess <laughs> that's my reaction. It's a very large cottage. The reason that that cottage is so large is because of how you define um, how you define the floor area, which includes the basement area. Oh, it does include the basement. It includes basement, okay. See, and so that. there's a, a little calculation on garages, I think, but it does include basement, which is why I raised that because otherwise my real idea in mind is like 1800 is a very nice good size uh you know building but at the same time if you're going you know most people would like a basement and that would uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. so that's, that's how that, we that's how we got there i it think it's it, a great size then yeah i think it's on the high side too but uh um, but i would say that we need to accommodate for utilities and then my other uh, my second reaction was uh on the ccrc's um because this, does this end up applying to the hospital as well or not? At the moment, no, because the base zoning of the hospital is not in one of the eligible districts and it's also not served by adequate infrastructure. So at the moment, um, the goal was not to compete with the hospital site zoning, but to um, more or less, uh, the only tweak that needs to be made for the hospital site to really be included is for the hospital's base zone to be added as to one of the eligible districts. Right now, I'm trying not to compete with it because I assume that you're going, you might not want this. Sorry, currently it's zone BI, so it will. Oh, it's in there? Okay. Yes. I think then it's the infrastructure issue that's, infrastructure. that's killing it um, because it also has to be on, on sewer and water. So, well, uh, so if it my were, issue here is just because of the fact that, uh, that I was involved in helping LaSalle build a CCRC. And so that, uh, and that was on 13 and a half acres in Newton, um, and it was 200 units. Economically, it doesn't work unless it's around 200 units. Um, yes. It, the administrative costs are, are kind of difficult to make it work financially. Um, and, this, and, this, and the, what did I made a note about here? Uh, on, oh, the fact that it needs to be in one building because the people that are 85 don't like walking outdoors in the winter. So you need connected corridors. It needs to be one huge building for these people like at North Hill or Fox Hill Village. Or, I mean, what LaSalle Village did was they built theirs in individual buildings that complied with the Newton zoning, but then they built connectors between them. So they don't have a mixed program between having either um, having uh, the, a continuum between um, independent living units that are frequently detached, uh, townhouses, and then uh, main they nursing have, facilities. They have that variety. Okay. They have most of it is independent living units, and then they do have a. Uh, uh, they decided after they. Because they actually provide lifetime care for yeah. people. And so what they were finding was that, and they have an on-site nursing home for that, but then with the dementia patients, yeah, the, the memory Alzheimer's care. population, they weren't really equipped to deal with that. They needed a locked area. So they've created an, an, uh, uh, a locked area now with that sort of... Yeah, with the memory care units. Memory care unit, yeah. And so typically, um, typically, or for, at least from my perspective, the CCRCs tend to be developed as a campus, and I don't necessarily think that there are things that would preclude attachment of buildings, but I think, um, you know, that's certainly a good point to note that most, uh, most campus-style facilities, especially if you are dealing with the elderly or disabled, you do need covered walkways and breezeways and attachments. And so, because there's... Uh, there's um, there's uh, the ability to do it in multiple buildings with minor setbacks between the buildings, but I hadn't conceived of an all-in-one, um, mostly because I um, hadn't conceived that Medfield would be supportive of that, of a 200-unit. I mean, that's what North Hill is. That's what Fox Hill is. Yeah. Um, it's just a, a monstrous building. I happen to like the look of LaSalle Village better because it's a, a series of buildings. Yeah. Um, with so, connectors, but... Yeah, frankly, it hadn't occurred to me that Medfield would be t particularly tolerant of a building with 200 units in it, even as part of um, even as part of something like this. And so, um, if I if uh, the direction is to consider that, I'm more than happy to. That's just why I hadn't. Well, my my only concern <laughs> is, and, uh, just as I say from my prior experience, that the economics of it may not work out if you make it smaller. So, I uh, yeah, I, we may you may zone for uh, whatever it is. Uh, uh, however many units you, you permit here, 100 beds, I guess. But it that's, may work that, you know, nobody can make that work financially, so that's the equivalent of that. I'm not, not doing it, basically. So uh, for within the CCRCs, um, for the portions of it that are dedicated to, because the 100 bed limit is just on the assisted or um, physical, you know, nursing, you know, the uh, full okay. care. Okay. And so that's either memory care, that's either fully assisted care or semi-assisted. Uh, so that was where the 100 bed limitation is. We can raise that. We can, um, we can, 
the sky is the limit. <laughs> well, I mean, 100 but beds should be enough for, for an assisted living and, and the nursing home. Component. That was generally my thought as well. Again, what I'm trying, what I thought was really going to be objectionable is a large number of units coming down at one time, especially you know with assisted living in particular, um, because it does tend to generate more emergency calls than some other uses. Um, yeah, not not to cast dispersions by any stretch, but that you know now and again that that's kind of the fiscal impacts that we're looking at as a result. We had 30, 38 nursing home beds at LaSalle Village to service, a, uh, well, it was originally built as around 165 units or something, then it was increased, but the 38 bed nursing home was really remains the same. around 100, and there was no ability to increase it, so it <laughs> remains the same. <laughs> I'm sure they would if they could. <laughs> um, We're shy on those units, uh, you know, regionally. <laughs> and, and then the other thing that, that I noticed in this was that, or that jumped out at me, was that there was no provision for multifamily, and, I, and I'm not sure how you build the, the assisted living, the 100-bed assisted living, if you don't have a multi uh, multifamily. I, I just wasn't sure whether that was permitted then or not. So we have uh, under definitions, we have a definition for multifamily. It's listed as an allowed use under Section D, and there are dimensional, they, they're in here. They're, if you uh, check the t um, if, uh, scan of the tables, for example, you can see the multifamily regulations and how they're regulated as a use, and they're also uh, tied to the special permit criteria for multifamily in the in the zoning bylaw itself. I guess my concern was whether or not the multifamily had to be a permitted use under under B here on, next to the CCRC to, to allow it to happen, basically, to allow the assisted. Oh, the absence of the word multifamily in here because I wrote cottages, two-family dwellings, and or townhouses. Right. Okay. I, I we can add multifamily to the. I have. Uh, if, I, that was an oversight on my part, not a uh, not an intentional. And then on the under under D uses. Yeah. There's just something under uh, that uh, F. And then uh, one one. I guess it says retail up to a maximum of, and it just has a, a number that it looks like it says S comma zero 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 square feet. So I just, five thousand. Oh, was that five thousand? Yes. Yeah. Right, that's my eyesight then. Uh -huh. The idea there was sometimes uh, people like to, especially in the CCRCs, like to, you know, maybe put in a little cafe or, um, you know, a little, um, not like a full-on pharmacy or drugstore, but a little convenience store, that kind of thing. Yep, absolutely. So and then, I don't think that's a bad thing, so I thought we should let it happen. <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. Those things are really nice amenities to have. Um, and then um, I skipped over, actually. Um, because under applicability in uh, on the front page under B, yeah, I guess I would include all of our zoning districts like industrial extensive as well, um, so that because we might choose, it might make sense to locate one of these facilities. I uh, was somewhat concerned, although this lar does really largely encompass most of the town, I was a little bit concerned whether or not we would be calling into some parcels, um, particularly over in this corner. I don't frankly know what happens over here. Uh, the area that's Barn. white, you mean? Barn, let me confer with your planner. E, which is um, the largest residential okay which is excluded which is yeah. why it's not highlighted yeah and so i so somewhat i so, i excluded your large lot residential because i thought that they would be unhappy no that's not the large lot res ie is industrial extensive so that's like two, up off of yeah West there's Street. two districts that weren't included the ie we i also didn't include because people usually don't want residential to compete with their industrial because they want the tax dollars off of the industrial but well but this is I'd be happy to make it town-wide, though. If <laughs> so I guess my thinking on it is that we always we seem to have trouble finding businesses that want to really locate in Medfield because we're a long drive from the from the big highways. What we do have is a lot of people that want to do residential here, and this is a sort of residential that has no that's a money maker in terms of our real estate property tax base, and so that I'm and and we did it our uh, our uh, committee that's looking at the hospital did an analysis of of property tax returns for, of commercial versus uh, a 42 unit um, um, the a, a senior housing apartment on, on lot three. Yeah. And, and, the, and the, uh, the residential returned a lot more in property taxes to the town than the, than the commercial use would have. And, and so that as a town, I think that if we can get more in property taxes, we should be looking at that even if we're using industrial land. Um, I will leave that to your determination. There's a lot of different arguments for that. I'd probably come out on the opposite side of that, Pete. If we, were, if we were running out of land here for residential development, 
and we were down to final, but I, I mean, this is a conversation we've had a number of times over this past year. We have a hard time developing, in my opinion, we have a hard time developing commercial because we have convinced ourselves that we're too far away from highways. It's not that we couldn't do it, it's that we aren't more, we aren't particularly inclined to make it easy for people to do it. And we think the only commercial development is somebody who wants to come in on a highway. And I think there's a lot of I don't think that's true, Gus. I think that, I, think that uh, I mean, the potpourri site uh, was pretty uh, underutilized for a long time. I mean, uh, I mean, we eventually ended up with the park down there because they couldn't find uh, users for it for commercial industrial uses. I, I think it's a reality. Uh, my, uh, my point is we've we, had, we've had rather than studies converting. Studies that have confirmed that it's the reality. Rather than converting land, which could be used for commercial, to make it residential, and we have land. It can be residential. I think we should work on building out the residential property first. And if we get down to the point where we don't have any land left and we have to figure out what to do with the last two lots, then I'm okay with going residential if that's where we're at, but we're a long way from that. Well, the, <clears throat> M the MAPC came out here about 15 years ago and told us that we were built out, basically, in terms of uh, as a town, that we didn't really have sites to build things. Um, we don't have many sites in town that we can build we do now. <laughs> larger sites, <laughs> larger <laughs> projects on. Well, yeah, we, we have a hospital site so right. that we have right. a place. But yeah. in general, uh, if you want to build a CCRC in town, you're going to have a lot of trouble finding a site. That is true, especially because the minimum lot size on it is 10 acres, which knocks out most of the available land. I do think that a CCRC is a good use. That you know, generally they're fiscally positive. I can't speak to every possible commercial use versus every you know iteration of res residential use with for which one is going to be the money maker. My, generally my, speaking, yeah. my main position is just don't build single family residential, and, <laughs> and from there we can work with it. But um, but. It's, um, you know, it, it is a balance that needs to be struck. Again, um, on this, you know, on this corner of town, the limitations for residential are the same as commercial, it's infrastructure. And so it's not, um, at least from my perspective, yes, that, you know, there are some businesses that are inherently attracted to highway. Um, suburban office park is it, bouncing back. Um, but altogether, I don't see that as, um, you know, there's a lot of people who are trying to chase R&D and that kind of thing. But it, a lot of what we really see, um, at least that I see that I think are more successful projects really are not those kinds of businesses, but they are the rare ones. You, you know, they're not necessarily the thing you can put out a sign and have them come get you. Some things are just opportunities that you can't predict. I mean, Jones Lang LaSalle did a study for the state hospital uh, property uh, for DCAM, and they basically said that, you know, you're just not going to get businesses and office parks built in or, or no, you could, for, you know, it served as a medical use for many years and, you know, again, in the realm of CCRCs and developments like that, that may be a, a welcome and con good continued use. I haven't worked on your master plan, I know, but you guys have put a lot into it. So that's part of my, part of why I wasn't really going hard on putting zoning for it because I pres I'm not, it's presumptuous from my perspective. So that no, that was it. Thank you. So I, <clears throat> I would defer to Pete's comments about size and scale. I have, without having any expertise, when I looked at the size for CCRCs, the thought crossed my mind: is that actually big enough? And I was probably thinking of the CCRC that's contemplated for the state hospital, which is what led me to feel like that was a small number. But I have no competence to know that. But I'll defer to him. The the one question I did have in this map, I answered it: is this is an overlay for the entire town? This is actually not an overlay for the entire town. It's an overlay that affects the RU, RT, RS, and VX. But it, but uh, fair enough. But, but it's, most of the, but all most, of the green yeah. areas in play. So, because I wasn't sure whether that was what we were talking about or whether we were talking about something that was more focused on maybe where the state hospital was, the the. Oh, I'm making a comment. I'm not staking out a position. I'm mindful of how zoning changes put us into the bind we're in on LCB, on what appeared to be a totally innocent, inconsequential change that has turned into something that potentially could, could disrupt the town, either financially, culturally, or not. Uh, when I look at this map, I'm finding myself wondering, well, okay, we didn't go into the large lot zones because those people wouldn't like this stuff. Uh, part of me says, am I sure that the people would 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 be okay with it everywhere else that they're going? Is the other part. The, I'm sorry, I have one technical okay, question. Sure. Is, that, is that in the town center village district? 
It's uh, RS right outside. Right outside. Okay, sorry. Now, the other side of me says, well, but ideally, I think a lot of seniors would prefer to be interspersed in neighborhoods. So I'm not, it's not, that's why I'm not staking out a position here. I'm just making an observation that on one hand, there's an awful lot of purple here, and I have no idea whether that those are smart places to go so or not. So you've got a map that will disabuse you of most notions uh, as far as the, with uh, identity. Yeah, that's the property. Sarah's noted, because uh, it's harder for me to figure out what a lot with no address the number is, and then look at this every rules, day. Yeah. <laughs> I can see how big it is, but uh, not who it is. Uh, everything that has a notation can pretty much uh, be ruled yeah. out. Okay. Um, and certainly there are some uh, okay. single families over here, single families up by Donnelly, yep. this is Bridge Street. Yep. Um, some parcels down in this area. Um, where it could be intermittent, but these are you know probably three acre parcels, not mm -hmm. the five, not to ten huge range. Mm -hmm. So you might have a cottage um, colony that would have a cluster where you would have an assisted living facility. It's also special permitted, and the special permit criteria have been considerably tightened up for this. Since LCB. Right. You need a microphone. I have it. <laughs> I mean, you've got a map with parcels as they exist now. What's to prevent people from buying parcels and tying them together to make them five acres? That's what happened with the LCB property. Right? Well, that that happens all the time yeah. is that people, yes. right, if they I'm accumulate parcels. Yes. If, if I'm following this, though, the, effectively what this overlay does is it would allow for a more dense number of housing units for the land. So there's nothing that would stop somebody from piecing together something, but this overlay in particular also allows for a higher concentration of housing units on a given parcel. Yes. I cannot preclude. You're gonna need a microphone too. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I can't preclude assembly and lot merger, which is why I raised the minimum lot size from two acres to three acres to prevent, um, to make that slightly more difficult and make it slightly less unpredictable. Nevertheless, where we do have lots that might be slightly more likely, they do tend to be high-end single-family residential, which I think is um, going to have, uh, should it hit market, going to fundamentally have maybe a different buyer than a developer looking to do cottage development. I don't, I, um, there is potential for it. I, I'm not going to get up here and say that it's absolutely impossible, but what I will say is that there, um, it is not something that could slide right through. It is something that requires multiple special permits. There's a lot of different criteria, um, and I don't, uh, I just don't anticipate people trying to do, you know, like the average single family homeowner trying to do a ton of land assembly to build, you know, a 42 unit assisted living facility. I could be wrong, but I, you know, there, that's, there's any risk inherent with having land use regulations, but. Since the right. zoning change that allowed uh, assisted living facilities in the RS zoning district, right. the original one, not the reversal, uh, we've actually added two sets of special permit criteria for the planning board. One, a general a special permit criteria and then an additional one that was passed this year at annual town meeting specific to multifamily in the RU district but this zoning bylaw uh, refers to that and, and Mike was were you part of the did you I know you did the work but it was this through the sponsorship of the affordable housing trust or yes yeah, so this is not really not not for the senior housing zoning it quasi we've been working with them but um, particularly because we're w looking at Hinkley um, which is not slated for affordable housing necessarily that's um, so I, I it's guess, a bylaw that has multiple partners let me, let me ask my it's question. within the community housing auspices of the yes, affordable housing let, let, me, let me ask my question a different way you think this is a good idea I think it well let me step back. Not to put you on the yeah, no, no. I, I think in general, if we are going, if we want to encourage the development of senior housing in town, the best way to do it is through an overlay district. If we decide we don't want to do it, then we don't do it. I think it would be, um, it wouldn't be very effective for us as a town government to try to pick the spots and say, here are six places where you should do senior housing. I, I think in general, I think this is similar to other towns have done this. Franklin has one. 
I think Millis has one. Um, so it's, it's a fairly common strategy if, as a town, you want to encourage senior housing development. I, personally, I think we should, you know, to Pete's point, if we're going to be encouraging housing development, we should encourage senior housing development. We obviously have uh, something of a market failure in that area. The, the, the demand for from the market for what to build in town is not senior-oriented housing. I think for the most part, um, any of these uses, depend, obviously depending on the location, right? LCB is a location issue. If LCB wanted to go at the state hospital or if LCB wanted to go to any number of other places, mm -hmm. I don't think there would have been any concern, right? That's purely a location issue, mm -hmm. which to my view gets taken care of in the special permitting process. I mean, the, you know, we have improved our special permit criteria over the last several years. Um, and I think all of us have expressed an interest in, in trying to encourage senior housing. There's only so many places we can do it as the landowner. Uh, we don't have that many options as the landowner. We have Hinkley, we have Lot 3, we have the hospital. Other than that, there's not a lot of, of real prime real estate where we can make a real difference. And so I think this is a, a market-oriented solution. It's not to say every jot and tittle of this proposal is correct. There might be things that need to be tweaked to make it better. I, I think in general, strategically, this is probably the way to go. Whether anybody takes advantage of it outside of Hinkley, who knows? Um, but it does give uh, a little more flexibility to try to hit the, the piece of our housing market that is not going to be served by kind of a pure top dollar approach. So I, I think the general approach is probably, again, if we want to encourage senior housing development, people of the town meeting decides we don't, we don't. Strategically, this is probably the best way to implement that, in my view. So that's my take on, on the overall approach, not necessarily the specifics. And I did have some questions, but you can continue with yours. Okay. No, I, I, um, I think what I'm here that's helpful, but that gives me some re reassurance that from a strategic standpoint, it's, I do think it's something we want to do. I think what I take from your comments is that you've tried to adjust some things here to minimize the risk that we would get put into some spot that we wind up having something go in that we actually don't want. We have controls to do that. Um, I take Pete's point about the, the size of what a CCRC could be, and I wouldn't automatically rule out loosening that if the economic, you know, if effectively by not loosening it, we precluded it from an economic standpoint, then I certainly would be open to figuring out ways to make that more of a possibility. First place I'm thinking of, of course, is at the state hospital where CCRC is already planned, but. Um, that's the uh, min lot size that we put in here is 10 acres. Um, he, Gus, was referring to, or, or uh, your Gus, I'm sorry, <laughs> Pete was referring to um, uh, needing 13 acres, and so, you know, 10 acres is slightly lower. I, um, I frankly think 10 acres is uh, pro possibly a tight site given wetlands and slope, but I think it's doable. Depends on the configuration, as all things so do. The only, the only comment I would have is if there's any apprehension about it and you want to wait for the senior housing survey to document the need, uh, but I, from the very early stages of the returns we've got, I think that we will be documenting a need. I just can't tell you how many of what type and what location are where the preferences are yet. And so I think to that point, I mean, from a, from a schedule standpoint, this is going to, to play into our later discussion about the state hospital. I mean, I think this, we're still in okay shape with respect to this in terms of the planning board hearings, right? I mean, if, if we're well, it depends on when we schedule. Right, depends on when we schedule it. I mean, I think, um, <laughs> but we, we don't have to decide immediately tonight, correct, in order to get in the window for October 22nd. Um, your next meeting is August, August 14th. 14th. Right. We decided that night right. with the caveat that it could be abbreviated mm -hmm. notice uh, rather than the full text uh, because they, for larger legal ads, they require it a week in advance. Mm -hmm. so. So, I mean, that it's, it's, I would, I mean, I, I have, have in my mind, and as we move this through, have thought that we would like to have mm -hmm. the results of that survey, and so we could kind of look at the survey results and make sure that we are, um, we've sort of hit the right notes with respect to the, the definitions. I know certain people, and if Tony Centauri is watching, we apologize for the use of the cottages. The cottages. Don't sorry. Like the word cottages. I'm sorry, Tony. I'm sorry. I don't like the word cottages, but other people do like the word cottages, so they're called cottages for now. Um, I but only use them in Newport and Bar Harbor. Right. <laughs> um, I, so I think that's, um, 
Right. So, so if we called them cottage. Cottages. <laughs> 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 um, so I, I would, my preference would be to, to get that input, you know, because we don't want to have to fix it again, um, and then you know, line it up for the for the special town meeting. And the, the, you've kind of answered the question a little bit, but I, I thought between Mark and Sarah, if you could speak to this special permit issue and kind of big picture how this compares to what we've had in the past, because I think obviously folks have, have concerns about, um, about LCB and other places, just to give a sense of, of how this slots in with kind of where we are from an existing standpoint with these types of uses. Put, putting aside some of the, 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 the cottage, cottage the developments, <laughs> um, yeah. kind of some of the bigger buildings and, and how that would currently look before and what this adds or what this subtracts. Kind of okay. what, would, what would change? I'll do my best. You might need to supplement. Yeah. Well, because I can tell you the the okay. the the, <laughs> <laughs> the prior special permits, which were also the zoning board of appeals, was a very loose set of standards. I think there were half a dozen, but they just were not very specific or detailed, and they didn't cover. They weren't comprehensive either. The set that's in place now is very comprehensive and very detailed. That deals with virtually anything you could think of. In, in great specificity in terms of impact on uh, community, uh, environmental factors, uh, anything that could possibly have a potential negative impact from a development and being plunked into a neighborhood where it just is not appropriate. So it gives the body, which is now the planning board, which frankly is where it, ever, it should have been, but that's a whole history in itself, but typically planning boards deal with development issues and therefore special permitting is properly, in my opinion, with the planning board, not the zoning board of appeals. It now is with the planning board, and they have the tools they need, uh, both in terms of those detailed criteria and the ability to require the developer at the developer's expense to retain the necessary consultants uh, to, to conduct peer review, independent review for, on behalf of the board. Sarah, anything to add? Um, I guess the only thing that I was thinking of is the, um, you know, these types of applications are more sophisticated than we're typically used to seeing, but the um, permitting process, the nuts and bolts of it are the same, no matter what type of application it is. I, I guess in, in the big picture, the caveat I have is if, if to go back to the concerns that, that uh, Tony Centuri uh, represented on behalf of a constituency of affordable housing with a small a. Uh, no disrespect, but no matter what you do, you can't force developers to do that kind of stuff. And it's only if you've got your own property, such as Hinckley, that you can, in the course of disposing of it, impose those kinds of conditions and ensure, assuming there's any interest at all, that you get that kind of a project. Otherwise, you, you got the zoning, unfortunately, the market's going to rise to the highest level. Perfect example, uh, you alluded to the Franklin earlier, the project over by the Franklin Country Club, which was modeled after the Medfield project here, uh, was represented, was going to come on the market for, I think, uh, high 300s. Uh, they haven't got, they started at about close to 600, and they've been going up ever since. So it's whatever the market will be once you give the developer a free reign. Right. No, and, that, and that's the reality, right? I mean, if you don't own land, you only have so much say over land you don't own. Right. And that's just one of the realities of, of you know, living in a free society. So, um, you know, for the land that we own, we can dictate, um, right. you know, our, our terms more effectively. I think in every category, I think one of the, the easier things about this effort from, from our perspective, in every category we have demand for senior housing, right? So it's not as though we have an oversupply of, of even senior-oriented housing at the high end, right? We don't have an oversupply of senior housing really in any category. And so I think, I think you had said this, Gus, at, at one of our, our many meetings on this topic that one of the things to think about is not just focusing on building a particular type of senior housing, but just building more senior housing. Mm -hmm. And so I think to a certain extent, we're not going to be able to satisfy every aspect of the market. We're not going to be able to satisfy every resident in town who wants to stay and have a particular um, type of house they want to move into or type of building they want to move into. But I think we can do better than we're currently doing 
in that department. And so I think the goal here is to try to move forward and, and do better than we're currently doing for, for our seniors in creating those, those opportunities. Um, and then we'll, we'll see what the market will bear. It may bear nothing. It may, it may be that this remains purple and they remain exactly what they are. And isn't it interesting in 20 years from now, no one will remember we have a senior housing overlay district. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because it doesn't but get I think used. I think you're absolutely right that it's the way to go. I mean, it's worked very well with the Affordable Housing Committee allowing the developers to create greater density to, to give us our safe harbor developments every year. And that's, I think that whole process is working out And this seems to work. I mean, the experience, Mark, and Frank, is generally positive that they've been able to develop more senior housing. Is that a fair assessment that it has retracted some interest at least? Yeah, they, they, they've been... The, the real classic seniors housing that, that we've worked on is has been very difficult because it's it's generally you're dealing with nonprofits who in turn are looking for multiple grants from state and federal governments. So uh, once once you come to terms with them, now you're waiting for grant cycles and it takes years and years and years. There's a large project uh, down by the police station. There's a second phase with a different developer that took literally years just to get to. Uh, land disposition agreement and now we'll be waiting more years while uh, he goes through multiple uh, grant cycles so these aren't things that are going to get built by uh, private developers well it depends what it is you're talking about there's the market stuff which is frankly you know it's a what depending on overall market conditions and where a developer can make the most money that's what they're going to do and i think to your point pete I mean, those type of developments from a from a town financial perspective are going to be positive well, capital. plus we're creating greater density so that hopefully it'll attract the developers to right. do it. Right. Right. So, I mean, you'd get something more like a senior housing version of Old Village Square or something like that. You may get another. Right. right. Well, that actually, yeah. Right. Um, really depends on the level of affordability for the types of developers. Um, when you require high levels of affordability, especially to serve um, income, you know, 30 to 50 percent of the area median income, which we have virtually no subsidy for. Um, when you start seeing developments like that, those are generally done by nonprofits. They're generally in for LIHTC rounds or for other funding sources. And so we see a little bit of variety there. I would picture and I would I would imagine, you know, that person who um, would be selected to develop Hinkley probably is not going to be a nonprofit, um, but will be a, uh, somebody who is more of a generally for profit developer who deals in senior housing. There's several profiles of who builds, but it, it really uh, depends on what the product is. Right. And not to step on my, my selectman report, but I mean, we do, we have made some progress in on the Tilden Village front. So in oh, terms good. Of, 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 of affordable, <laughs> low-income senior housing. Um, rental. Rental. <laughs> that, that is finally moving ahead. Congratulations. Um, I'm so pleased and, to hear that. Um, yeah. Well, again, you're in the, it, as you described, there's going to be multiple rounds of, of yeah, so state that, funding and whatnot, but at least the agreement between the Medfield Housing Authority and the developer who's going to develop that project has been consummated, and he's moving forward with his application, project, project eligibility application to uh, DHCD. Beautiful. So on that end of it, that's, that's a positive, positive development. So uh, questions or comments from the public? I see... Public number one, Mr. Massaro, <laughs> microphone, please. Uh, I, I just had two questions. Uh, the first one, uh, does inclusionary zoning apply to... Uh Inclusionary zoning applies as it normally applies to developments. Uh, so six units are great. We set it. Do we set it at six? Six, six to twenty is fifteen. Yep. Twenty-one to forty-nine is. Yep. Yeah. And so um, that that will apply as usual. The only um, the only thing that inclusionary zoning does not apply to are single-family subdivisions, which were excluded when inclusionary zoning was adopted. Now, how about CCRC? I I was told that it, for example, on LCB, that we would not be. I would think that the a, um, assisted living facility is going to trigger your inclusionary zoning based on the number of beds. Isn't there a conversion for? Um, I, do we write in a? Con I usually, well, I write in a conversion for if if we're going to um, require it for nursing homes. You might not have required it. That doesn't it sound for familiar. So let me just raise that as something something to look at because when when LCB was here with one of their very first meetings, and I asked them about you know. Uh, how many affordable units they were going to have? They gave us a rather long response about how they weren't required to do so. Hey. Let me well, let me finish. And I said, so let me get this straight. So you're adding 78 units to our housing number, and zero 
uh, affordables putting us eight units in the hole for, for your project. So I would just raise that. I'm not looking for an answer here. I would just say I would have that same question or concern here about what happens with a CCR unit here. Don't have to answer it. There's a court case in Hingham several years ago uh, that had to do with whether or not assisted living facility units are eligible for the subsidized housing inventory. And I believe Hingham lost, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so I know that there is uh, some um, there is some legal ambiguity there about their inclusion, but beyond that, um, I would really have to review. Uh, I, th the, I think we should at least know that I, before we get too Sometimes we put in a conversion factor for assisted living. Every three beds counts for an affordable unit. Some people decide that they don't want to, um, they don't, don't want assisted living as part of their, you know, that they just want inclusionary to apply to standard housing. Okay. Um, so that that is something that may have happened. And my other question was regarding Hinkley. Now, this is the new Hinkley based on the, the, yes. the splitting of the two lots. Does it include any of the land from that was primary, uh, originally council and aging? Uh, yes. Okay. The All plan's right. on record already. So you're actually making maximum use of the- Yeah, the, yeah, there's a little slice that was- That's fine. Uh, subdivided. Those are my only questions. Because uh, we want to get their input for where they wanted the line to be. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Get the microphone down there. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I, 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 I read the, the draft, and I'm not an expert on this kind of thing, but I found a lot of items in the draft that were already sort of con uh, in conflict with current bylaw. And I know there's a sentence at the end that says, well, anything that's in conflict, the previous bylaw applies. But I found that could be rather confusing and could lead to some gaming of the system. So, for example, I noticed the buildings were allowed to be 45 feet. And I thought the limit in town was 35 feet. So I don't know how you can do both. In height? Yeah, I mean, this is, these are the provisions of the overlay district, yeah. um, which is different than underlying zoning. So. But then there's a sentence saying that other zoning laws apply. Well, other, it's self-contained. This, 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 you've got your basic zoning why it's an overlay district is you've got your basic zoning provisions that apply throughout the town and then this is literally a layer either plus or minus in certain areas as defined that adds requirements or uh, adds uses and subject to conditions etc all right well i have a lot of concerns about that because i don't think any building in benfield well, that's should why be you have by special high. permit that's why you well, well okay but permit. then then i see the special permit says if it meets all the things in the by in the new bylaw then they have to approve. And I think that's a very different process than what the ZBA has been doing when there's more discretion and determination of what's good for the town. And so if you've got something in there that's it's 45 feet tall and then and they meet that requirement, then I don't see any discretion there. The 45 feet itself requires a special permit. So anything that's in excess of the base zoning district, let's say that the under, you know, let's say it's zoned. But, but it, we'll just call it B. It's and B. Let her finish the answer or yes. you're, not, you're not an expert on zoning, so okay. let her answer the question. Sure. I'm just wearing that outfit tonight. <laughs> um, let's say that the let's say that the underlying zoning says, okay, you can have a house and it can be 30 feet tall. By adopting this, it's kind of an extra layer on top of it that says, okay, but if you're going to do senior housing and you're going to do it in a multifamily building and it's going to meet all of these criteria, you can ask the town to allow you to go up to 45 feet, but the town has no obligation to approve a special permit. A project has to meet all of the criteria and prove that it is a benefit to the town and to the public at large before a special permit itself can be granted. And that's I, I, very consistent with the current process. Um, what you're referring to with the ZBA's process is uh, they have the exact same requirements. They couldn't make all the findings, so they couldn't grant the permit. If they made positive findings, then they would have granted the permit. Right, but I, I think yeah, the way it seems to be written to me was, was that if, if it meets, then it's approved. And that's not actually the way the ZBA bylaw is, is written. It's saying they, 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 they not must approve. Finish, and then you can. <laughs> <laughs> not must approve, it may approve. And, you know, take, in, take into account all kinds of, of issues. And then, then, you know, I might add with 45 feet, we also have a bylaw in town that says, well, you can make things even taller with the pertinent structures, uh, like antennas and spires and, and, and equipment on the roof that can make it even higher as long as you have your setbacks bigger. So now you're talking about things that could be 55 feet, even bigger. 
So I, I think there's a real issue you, here, and I'd, you, I'd, I'd like this to be considered as you go forward. I'm not saying... Just for clarity, you can't pick and choose between using the base zoning and using the overlay. You either go for the overlay and it's contained, or you go for the base zoning. So the pertinent structures thing wouldn't apply here? That's correct. I, I still think 45 feet is too, too big for any building in Medfield. Could I and ask this a dumb question also about that? Is the 45 yeah. feet, just so I understand, because I don't... Uh, does the particular choice of 45 feet, is that like you can have a three-story structure with a peaked roof or something? Is that, what's the rationale behind 45 feet? It's a small four-story building or an average three-story. It's three and a half. Okay. So that um, the idea was if you were going to have multifamily buildings, I was hoping that you could at least get the floor to floors to clear three stories and mechanical. And just also, um, I, I appreciate the feedback and I'd like to keep it coming, but this isn't the final you know, output, right? So what happens tonight is you either consent or not or at the meeting on the 14th and having it go forward for the planning board's public hearing. And that's really where the feedback, um, we have the ability to, we can obviously change it now before it goes to the public hearing, but we can massage it and change it drastically through that public hearing process as well. Can I go back to the gentleman's first question where he said in, in somewhere in here it basically says if the underlying zoning contradicts this the underlying zoning severability so my only question is if in this case what i just heard you say is with an overlay that puts up a new set of, of allowances what would be an example of something that the overlay would allow that the underlying zoning would prohibit and therefore the underlying zoning would apply um i was on board i was going to say it allows multifamily for seniors in resident single family residential neighborhoods That's and the then overlay. yeah and then you said what the overlay would prohibit well, I so think that I guess yeah i have to sorry. look back through i think the original point he made was that there was wording at the end of this that basically said in the event there was yeah. a contradiction between this overlay and the basic zoning the basic zoning requirements apply but we already talked about how in an overlay that overwrites some of the basic zoning. So I was looking for an example of where the opposite would be true. So um, severability or conflict with other bylaws is standard when you add things to a zoning bylaw as opposed to do a whole stock recodification. And the reason that we do that, uh, the literal um, wording says, the provisions of this bylaw shall be considered supplemental of existing zoning bylaws. To the extent that a conflict exists between this bylaw and others, the more restrictive bylaw slash ordinance or provisions therein shall apply. So how do you get to a 45 foot building? So if there is, if it's found to be, it, so what would be in conflict is if the building was 55 feet, not 45 feet. The special permit allows for whatever the delta is between the base zoning and the 45 feet. Where it's in conflict, I believe, is where you would be going above the 45 feet. Other issues of conflict tend to deal with wetlands, um, where we hit, where we see our standard conflicts are wetlands, where we want the wetlands bylaw to be the one that takes over. Yeah. Um, same with DPW spec, same with low, in, uh, low impact, same with stormwater regulations. So the main thing that we're trying to say is that where there are more restrictive regulations, not so much within zoning necessarily, but within the whole panoply of the town's bylaws, that um, where there are more restrictive bylaws, particularly with respect to environmental constraints, we want those ones to rule the day. Could I ask another specific question? Another, sure. another bylaw that is that there's no assisted living is not allowed in a res an RS district which not currently pardon me not currently right so but this would appear to since RS district is part of the four districts that you have this would appear to allow res assisted living in an RS district that's correct it would allow assisted living on a five acre lot in an RS district well then we've got LC that would just let LCB right back in they've got a five well, acre lot they I got think, a more than a five I think acre some lot. of the confusion here is and I think in presenting this it would be helpful to have the general special permit criteria that would apply because I think that that's not in the memo no right no. so I mean the findings that you're talking about are in all the various criteria that Mark described. And so yes, it would absolutely allow something that's not currently allowed under the zoning. It would be allowed by a special permit. And so- I mean, the, um, very, the very first one, without going to all of them, just by comparison to LCB and what was in effect then, this is what's in effect now. Overall design is consistent and compatible with the neighborhood, including as to factors of building orientation, scale, and massing. 
that that wasn't in there before at all. So that's right there out of the out of the box. The that's great, but I just point out that town meeting voted quite overwhelmingly a couple of years ago to not have this is living in RS district. So if you this if you're going to go forward with this and get it past the town meeting, I think you might want to take that out. Oh no, I mean I, I remember I was there, but I mean obviously that was in the context of a of a overall problematic issue at the time, right? It was not with the current special permit. And look, the, the town meeting could decide we do not want to encourage senior housing in Medfield, and they'll vote no, right? I mean, that's well, kind of the, uh, I, what, I, what, we, what we can't do with any sort of law of general applicability, right, is you can't decide you've got one thing you're against and measure a law of general applicability against that one thing. Right now, it's a good example. It's, it's a good thing to think about how would this apply. I think if you were to apply the entirety, you know, to your example of the LCB project, if you were to apply the entirety of our current special permit criteria to that project, it would be very different than the criteria that were in place at the time. I mean, one of the things that we did since that time was adjust our special permit criteria to take into account additional issues that were not there before. Now, I mean, the, the criteria were sufficient before, um, but they are better now. And so you're, you're, comparing, you're comparing two different things. So you would not be applying the criteria that were in place at the time to a proposed project under this law. The only other thing I can add to that, and the, one of the key differences between a project that would be permitted under this bylaw and the LCB application, is that this bylaw precludes any assisted living facility that has more than 50 beds. LCB is significantly larger, and so there is a scaling issue that in itself is addressed simply by that parameter as well. I, I, I agree, and, 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 but 50 beds in that location would still have been a disaster. and. And I just want to say that I, I, I would like to see more senior housing in Medfield. And, but I think that if it's going to go forward, you might want to have all these things addressed and maybe modified in the planning board. And, and I noticed one of the questions was, um, you know, how much should be published? I think everything should be published, including this document that Mr. Sorrell just. I mean, I think he's reading from the town's current zoning bylaw. So that's on the town website. Okay. I think that should be put put, put out yeah. there at the it's same time. It's not an amendment, so. Yeah, I, I think from a presentation standpoint, though, it would be helpful to simplify it for people to understand yeah. in the sense that here is what the criteria will be applied in addition to what's in here, right? So in terms of just looking at it as a single document, I mean, yeah, if the people who know what they're doing can go look in the zoning bylaw and say this would apply, but I think for the general public to understand, it would be helpful to say here's what the criteria are and here's how it would actually work. Sure, if situation. I put it on the website, we can hyperlink to the appropriate yeah, sections of the perfect. zoning bylaw. Yeah, just so people can compare the special permit criteria against kind of the additional overlay pieces mm -hmm. of it. So let, let me ask another dumb question in light of this discussion here. Is this truly a do you want senior housing in Medfield, accept this bylaw, or otherwise no? Or is part of the public process, is it feasible to have the public say we don't want open open license for assisted living facilities in Medfield, but we do want senior housing of the other types, so get rid of that category. Uh, I would say that there is that flexibility. I think our goal um, all along, um, particularly with working with the seniors, was to maintain maximum diversity among the housing options that could be built. Um, as uh, Selectman Marcucci has said, uh, you're not knocking it out of the park in any category, whether it's rental, ownership, multifamily, single family, attached, duplex, um, doesn't really matter. You don't really have much supply outside of Tilden Village. Um, so I don't think it's um, all of this or the highway, um, but my recommendation is that we have worked very hard to listen to stakeholders for two years at this point um, with their feelings about senior housing and are trying to put together something that I think would have the maximum benefit, but I do not believe that this is a free license by any stretch of the imagination. There are lots of restrictions built into this. And so I think some of this is really the importance of making it clear how, um, how zoning works kind of in the big picture and how this individual bylaw works and plays with the other regulations. The, the reason I'm asking, and this is probably more political sensitivity than anything, is given the road we've gone down over the last couple of years around assisted living, it, it, there's, there's a broad range of senior housing needs given the sensitivity of that particular issue and the breadth of this particular overlay, uh, even whether it's groundless fear if it made a difference between getting public support. And I'm not trying to push it one way or the other. I'm just 
want to know whether that's even an option. If it's a way of getting public support for the basic idea of options for seniors, that at least if that's the direction that the feedback came, we'd be able to accommodate them. This gives you maximum flexibility in the range of senior uses right, and right. maximum flexibility in the, in the zoning districts. You could restrict mm -hmm. either or both mm -hmm. if you wanted to make it narrower options. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I mean, I think some of those issues, I mean, I, I would, I mean, I hear you loud and clear. I think some of those issues are planning board issues in the sense that you're getting into some of the more details of the, of the special permit process and how they're going to apply it. So I wouldn't want to get into, at least from our perspective, sort of tweaking it 45 feet or 35 feet or 38 feet. I think that's a planning board question in the sense, how are they going to be comfortable in applying this? Mm -hmm. I, I think to your point, um, you know, obviously, Assisted living, CCRC, that's one of the things that's in the mix at the hospital that's far and away the best location for anything like that. And I think we do have buildings that are 45 feet or higher at the hospital. And, and with, with sufficient infrastructure, the hospital could be brought into this overlay district. So well, I, I was actually going the opposite direction yeah. and said, leave, leave it out so yeah. we can put the CCRC put the that we want with yeah. 45 feet. Yeah. But if this has to be passed by the, by the public and it requires, I think, still a two-thirds yep. majority, and if that was... It's not an either or. It's that. If that's a sticking point. We can redline it out. It does remain. Um, it does leave your assisted living and the use table to be an and issue. That's what I was just checking on. Yeah. If we're thinking about specifically Medfield State Hospital at Zone BI, mm -hmm. that's something that's allowable by a special permit from the ZBA currently. Mm -hmm. So we could leave, we could just not touch it. If, yeah, yeah. If, one if, more quick comment. If you more. want this. This is living in CCRC to be at the Medfield State Hospital. Why not draft the zoning to have it that way instead of being allowing it people to accumulate parcels anywhere in town, pretty much, except I guess the RE district, which I'm not sure quite sure why that's not included too. Why not to accumulate parcels and and, and then you've you've got a big headache. And I I think this could be redrafted to to ensure that the state hospitals where something like this would go. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Courtney, thank you very much. Oh, I had one more, oh, sorry. one more comment, which is, and it ties into what Mr. Cohen was saying about uh, about the special permit, and and the the way that it is actually worded in C does make it sound like the special permit is not permissive. It sounds like it's mandatory, shall issue, um, or shall require the grant. Um, so I guess I would ask if you maybe take a look at the language there. It gets planning board special permit has extensive appellate. Uh, uh, case law for guidance. So yes, it's different from a variance. <clears throat> Nobody has a right to a variance, primarily because it's almost impossible to meet the, the criteria. Well, that's but what special permit criteria, if they are met, yes, you have to issue the special permit. Under C here, it says, Shall. if you meet the criteria of Section A, you, get, you have to issue it. Then it goes on and talks about the other criteria. And the criteria uh, in, in the Section a above are just, those are just. Uh, um, no, it says subsection A shall require the grant of a special permit. That means that a grant of a special permit is required to use it to be able to do this to begin with. The right. special permit shall be granted if the proposal meets the requirements of this section of the bylaws, the site plan review sections, and the multifamily uh, sections. Right. All right. So, well. But if the word shall <laughs> feels bad to you, we can use the word may. The planning board may approve. May, may approve would certainly make me feel a lot better. I so, am happy with the word may. <laughs> the shells, coulds, and mays of this world are what makes it go round. There's a lot of litigation about the use of may and shells. There so. <laughs> is, and that's that's why we're having this talk. Well, I mean, the... the, the, the to put a mite in there. The evidentiary, <laughs> the, the evidentiary fact is, is, is what drives it. And basically... The courts are very deferential to denials of special permits based on some credible evidence uh, that would justify the denial, failure to meet the criteria or something negative. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the, the case law is very clear that even if the judge, on his or her having heard the case, could could issue the special permit, they can't do it if if on the other hand, uh, reasonable minds could disagree, if you will. So it's a very deferential uh, legal standard as far as the local 
special permitting goes. So I, I would just redraft that first sentence in C because it can be read different ways. Uh, it can be read that it's mandatory to issue the special permit if you're coming in under A as well, opposed I wanted, to the way that I you're intending it. I do want to say it. that it shall require a grant of a special permit. We do want that. It needs to say I would, I, would, I would turn it around and say a special permit is required for, okay. for things coming in under Section A just okay. because that gets you out from Less ambiguous requiring is to grant them the special Getting permit. Getting shell out of the picture. All righty. Thanks right. for making me happy. And so we, we can <laughs> we can put this on for August 14th as well. You don't need to come back, Courtney, okay. Sarah, you can come. Can you come on the 14th? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and then you can look at the planning board calendar for getting the hearings on there. And, yeah. and we'll be talking in our next segment about the October 22nd date as well. So um, we'll see how that shakes out. All right. But before we move on to the Medfield State Hospital next, I see Chief Carrico here. And are you here just for, out of your interest in senior housing and the goings out in Medfield, or, or do, you, do you have something to share with us? Ah, okay. Well, then you may have to wait a while. <laughs> interest you in some of the fine restaurants here in downtown Medfield. Particularly the ones with bars. No. No, no. no. <laughs> All right. Thank Do you, you need Courtney. Anything? Nope. All Thank right. you. Thank, Thank you, Courtney. Have a good night. Thank you, Courtney. Thank, Thank you. Ladies. All right. So, um, session. so uh, Medfield Wait. State Hospital, um, picking up on our discussion from the last time. Um, so I, I, we've got a couple of things to talk about here, with respect to the development and implementation committee. Um, and we can get to that. I, I think from a scheduling standpoint, I think we ought to walk through and, and map out a schedule uh, for the issuance of the RFI. Oh, the one thing we do need from Sarah, actually. You want to go over the dates. On the dates. Yeah. The dates with respect to that. Get her. Uh, yeah, I forgot, I forgot about that. I, um, to go through kind of and set a schedule for the RFI, the zoning hearing, uh, our agreement on the zoning, submission to the planning board, and then special town meeting and how that would, would shake out. Um, I had got copies of two resumes here if people were interested in serving on the implementation committee. Um, but that's what I was hoping to accomplish tonight, to come out of this with a schedule and hopefully a committee created for um, issuing an RFI. Does it, Peter Gus, do you have anything to add to? I don't think we'll create the committee today. Uh, there's, there's, I don't think we have enough candidates yet because uh, I've got some that I want to talk to them. I haven't talked to them. I've been gone on this. So I'm sorry, Gus, I can't hear you. Uh, yeah, I don't expect that they will create the committee today because I don't think we have all the candidates yet. Okay. Okay, well, that makes it but, easy. We're going to have to find a date other than October 22nd. Um, and so we should start talking. When do you think we can create the committee? Uh, I, w I was assuming it would probably take us the month of August to get there, oh, okay. uh, to be honest. But I thought we were going to create it tonight. Yeah, I'm not. All right, then, uh, let's get, a ca get our calendars out. And so let me just uh, mention something that, that I had a conversation with someone today who offered not to be on the committee, but offered to come and talk to us, basically, and give us expert information. Um, and so that and, and could, we could meet with a couple people. Um, and I just, it, it, I don't think either one of them want to be on the committee. Um, but we could well, get some really it's kind of similar to what we had when we had Chris McMahon and Peter Bean. Yeah, well. yeah, yeah. But I think that we would get uh, some really excellent information out of these people. Yeah. I mean, one of them is the guy that uh, was involved in, in marketing the Montrose property, so he's very familiar with what's available or what's mm -hmm. doable in the town of Medfield, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I was going to suggest that I don't know that, that maybe if we could somehow have a special meeting just to meet with them for that purpose that mm -hmm. that might be. That's fine. Do you want to reach out? I mean, I, I think we, we should set a schedule here. Can we say we're going to create the committee on August 21st? I, I think the very first thing we should have is the resume circulated so we can actually figure out who they are. Uh, so when do we, so do you have all the, you have all the resumes you're expecting to get? I have I two and there's a couple of additional people I'm going to talk to. Okay. Yeah. So I, I mean, I'd like to know who it is we, we've got to look at before we create the committee. Okay. And I would guess probably if we have those all pulled together, we need, you know, if we get them at one meeting, we can make the decision by the next meeting. 
Um, Can we try to get them by the 14th of August? Yeah, I, th I think so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And do you want to talk, Pete, to your contact about their schedule and when? Because yeah. I, mean, I think it would make sense that these folks meet with that committee and not just with us. I mean, I mean we, we could have sort of a, 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 yeah. you know, okay. a, a short CLE in real estate this whole fall and have yeah. people in here, Siriatum, to, to weigh in, but I think it would be better to have that organized with the implementation committee. Okay. And well, so, what, is, what is it they're going to talk about, Pete? Like, like with Peter Bean and Chris McMahon, I think that was a good discussion for us to have because of what they were talking about in terms of how, to, how we should even be thinking about it. Are these guys ones that will help advise the development committee how to go about doing it? Or are they talking more about to us about master developer and not master developer? I think they're more talking to us about about next steps, how to approach what tasks yeah. we have in front of us. <laughs> so that's the case. I, I agree. We don't want to have teach the board of segment how to develop real estate over the course of the fall. But if that's the kind of discussion, that's what I think we should hear before we set the course for this committee. Uh, if that's what they're talking about, but if they're if it's actually no, advisory of the committee, that's. A I mean, different it's just story. well, it's just. I mean, it's people with huge experience, yeah. uh, in, in large things. So. I mean, I mean, at the very least, if they, if we if we're doing this, on the fourteenth, if they're available to come in, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to stretch this out, Mike. I, it's just saying if we know of somebody who has that expertise, and it's expertise that's useful to us as opposed to the development committee, if we can bring them in, that's a good thing. I, I'm sure. I mean, I guess I would rather have a beginning and a middle and an end to what we're going to do, right? So if we're going to keep getting more input on what we're going to do, then are we going to get that input on the 14th and say, well, gee, they've got some good ideas. Maybe we do it this way, and then we'll, okay, spend the next month figuring out how we're going to adjust to do that. And then, you know what I mean? Like at some point, we do actually have to, I thought we had reached an agreement uh, the last time we were here that issuing an RFI. Yeah. And that the first thing that this development committee is going to do is issue an RFI. Mm -hmm. And so I think unless... Pete, your folks want to come in and try to persuade us not to issue an RFI. Yeah, no, I don't know what the, what the yeah. advice would be. I, I would suggest that, that we, I'm happy to have them come to one of our meetings. I'm also happy to have them come to a meeting of this committee um, if, if that would be most useful. But do you want to talk to them and see if they have a view on whether they'd rather meet with us <laughs> or meet with the All right. committee? All right, I'll I, do I, that. I, just, I, don't, yep. I don't want to spend yep. that much more time kind of deciding what we're going to do, I'd rather spend a little more time doing it. Well, let, so let me, let me comment on where, how I see this needing to play out. First off, we don't have a, we don't have a final master plan yet. Uh, so t to my mind, the master planning committee, I know they're close, so I'm not, this is not a slam at the master planning committee, but we ought to have a master plan, and we ought to have the financials to give us confidence of what it is we're actually dealing with as we move forward in development. And I think that's something, in my mind, that's something that the Master Planning Committee is continuing on to complete, to include the, to include the, the work they're doing around zoning. At the point that we, develop, we establish this development committee, I don't see the Master, I don't have a problem if the Master Planning Committee continues finishing what it's doing while the development committee is going along, but I don't think that we have a Master Planning Committee and a development committee both working trying to figure out how to move ahead with the hospital. I think that we do want to transfer the responsibility over the development committee. So for me, a criteria here is we need to get the Master Planning deliverables done and in so that we can then hand them to the development committee. We have to write a charter for that committee if pe the people you've talked to are, pe are people who can get us smarter about what that charter should ask for, then it makes sense for me to, to talk to them and hear what they have to say. Uh, I do have a, a, a it's a really a preliminary draft RFI that came in from uh, Peter B. and Chris McMahon, so mm -hmm. I give it, so at least we know what one right. looks like. Because so, I mean, um, it seems to me, I mean, I, I think as I thought about the charter of this committee, I don't think we need to give them a complete charter now, right? And because the first thing okay. we're going to do okay. is we're going to issue an RFI. We're agreed upon that, correct? And mm -hmm. that RFI mm -hmm. is going to say something, and I agree with you, that before the RFI goes out, mm -hmm. we have to have a completed master plan from the, mm -hmm. the Medfields mm -hmm. Health Hospital Master Plan. Mm -hmm. My view was that we would not, um, at that point, as a board, be taking a position on that master plan. We wouldn't be endorsing that master plan, but that the master plan would be somehow the subject of the RFI, right? So we would not be asking for people who are developers to write on a fresh canvas in response to the RFI, but we would be asking for input 
with respect to the master plan, the implementation of it, does it work? But how do you frame the question? So, so to put words in your mouth, well, we wouldn't necessarily endorse the master plan as the master plan is defined, and that's why we're going up for the RFI to get feedback from developers about how Correct. it might be adjusted. We also can say that we're not rejecting the master Correct. plan. Right. Okay, yeah, okay. Right, and so then, the, so the first thing we have to do for this committee that has to, for example, one of the gentlemen I spoke to, he thinks he can be helpful on the committee in the RFI process, and then would probably be bowing off if he got past the town meeting to an RFP disposition because of his, where he works, he'd have a lot of conflicts, and so it wouldn't, you know, oh. it wouldn't make sense for him to be on the committee beyond that. So he'd like to be able to, his, his firm would like to be able to be one of the bidders, is what he said. His firm is a large bank that's yeah. most likely oh. does business with almost all, any, well, a large number of the bidders. So he couldn't be in a position, he'd be recusing himself from evaluating okay, the bids, but he, he might be interested in you know, contributing okay. when it's sort of not actually issuing it to anybody. Okay. Right? So first thing we have to do is decide what the RFI is going to say and issue the RFI. That's step mm -hmm. one, right? Pete, you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Step two is we then have to kind of assimilate, assimilate review the information we get back from the RFI, right? And then decide. So, and when we say we need to issue the RFI, that's with the development committee in place? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. The, okay. And I think the development committee has got to be in place sure before the RFI work. So, well, so the development committee works with the Board of Selectmen yep. to issue an RFI. Okay. Yep. Then the development committee works with the Board of Selectmen to assimilate, and they will make a recommendation, advice mm -hmm. on some type of adjustment to the master plan or mm -hmm. adjustment to the proposed zoning or something else. Mm -hmm. At which point then we have, we, the Board of Selectmen, have to agree on what it is we're going to propose from a zoning perspective to the planning board. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's step two. All right, then step three is it gets submitted to the planning board. We have the planning board hearings that go on. Mm -hmm. uh, and then step four is after the planning board hearing submission of that to the special town meeting. Now, part of what I think hopefully we would get from the RFI process is some input as to whether when we go to that special town meeting on zoning, we're also going there with a disposition article for part of it. Right? So, we're gonna, so when I say we're gonna have to decide on the zoning, we, the Board of Selectmen, are gonna have to decide what are we going to propose to the special town meeting with respect to the zoning and disposition of Edfield. We may just say, look, all the advice is just get the zoning done, and then do an RFP process and go back for disposition. But the advice may be, no, 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 you want to have dispositional authorization and the zoning, to, whatever it is, whatever the answer is, we're going to have to frame then coming out of the RFI process what's going to go to the special town meeting. Does that make so, sense? So, yeah, the one thing you left, the one thing that I think we're going to need for the special town meeting, not because they voters have to vote on it, but because we need to have it, is the master plan needs to be master plan as modified by whatever inputs we get from the RFI needs to be presented in a, in a digestible and understandable enough way mm -hmm. so that when we go to the voters and ask them to approve the zoning, they understand the context of that approval is this concept for the master plan, which it not only has been recommended by this master planning committee, but has been validated, if you will, by people in the market who basically say, if you do it this way, we think this is an economically feasible approach. Then they can make a. Then they can vote on the zoning. Right. Yeah, you agree with that? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's what okay. we're going to come yeah. out of that RFI process with yeah. is what it is we're going to be presenting. To the, and I agree with you. Mm -hmm. The zoning on its own is not going to be. It's not that helpful to me, right? right without the right. master plan. Right? Right. The master plan sort of shows this is what we'd like to accomplish with the zoning, mm -hmm. and then we'd have to frame sort of what happens after the special town meeting. Yep. But I think this is the task for. The development committee. So it sounds like what we're going to try to do then is have all the resumes together to distribute on the 14th, the 14th okay. and then create the committee on the 21st yes. with whatever charter we want to create it with. I, I would suggest a charter that just takes us through a special town meeting, um, but we can talk about that. Yeah, whether that's fine. Because, I mean, that, that's sort of the major inflection point as to whether there's even going to be a further disposition process on the far end of it. Um, that's fair. Uh, I, I, just, I think the people we pick for that committee are going to be people who are capable of carrying it out, though. Tenons, so the absolutely. idea is it wouldn't be that we'd then rethink it. Nope. It'd okay. be, it would yeah. be the same okay. committee, but okay. in terms of when people ask what's the commitment, yep. I think the commitment you're asking for is through a special town meeting, yep. and then we'd, hopefully we'd like you to stay on beyond that, but that's sort of what the task is. All right. So we have 814 resume circulation. So for all of you watching at home, if you're interested in serving on this committee, please get your resume to us by August 14th. And you have experience uh, in real estate. And you have experience real in real estate. Um, 
814, and then we'll look to create the committee on the 21st. Um, if we create the committee on the 21st, what do we think is a realistic period of time to develop the RFI to be issued? I don't think that will take long. The bigger question is when do we think is the realistic time that we will have the final master plan complete with the financial information we need? That's probably the bigger. I, what, what I'll, we don't need to talk about this because, because it'll take you all two minutes to review it, but there's, this is a preliminary. This came from uh, Peter Bean. Um, and, and he kind of, he kind of sketched it in a little bit to be, uh, it's it's not the right, it's not a true draft in the sense you you'll like his schedule because he has things happening in August, but uh, you know also, but he also has things like that this is a complete sale of the property, you know. So he's right. he's taking from his experience. But the, the, what was meaningful to me is, I don't know what an RFI looked like. Some people said it's two pages. This one's five pages. It's all understandable. Uh, it, it would be backed up with a master plan. So there's, you know, there's specificity that's not in this draft, but in terms of understanding what's the task, mm -hmm. I found this pretty helpful to finally understand what we we're, you know, bigger than a bread box, smaller than a barn. It looks something like this. Right. And so yeah, so we have helpful. 814, yep. resume, collection, circulation, et cetera, discussion. 821, creation of committee. Mm -hmm. um, now, I don't have any recent information about the status of the master plan. You, Gus, you said they're close. Pete, is your understanding that they're close? Christine, Sarah, are we they're close? Close? All right, just got, just Bill. Got, just got the financial model. <laughs> microphone. Oh, yeah. When's Bill birthday? We should get Bill's own microphone. Yeah. <laughs> we need to. We can get think, him like a lavalier. I think he's sort of walk I around. Think, I think Bill merits a podium myself. <laughs> 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 oh, <God. laughs> And what I can say is I, I spent, well, Pete, you and I both spent a couple of hours with Randy and Pat on the draft plan, which in terms of as a document, I thought even a couple of weeks ago was actually in a reasonably good shape. We provided detailed feedback, and I think they were, you know, it was at the real mic editorial level. Uh, so it felt to me like that the, the actual document itself, leaving aside all that financial stuff, the, the the document itself was close to being completed, so I don't I don't see this being a big deal. In terms of the financial, and again, some of the, I mean, if you read what's in the financial section in the master plan without the financial model there, I mean, it sums up what's in the model. Yeah. The question for some of the members of the committee is then what are the details that make up the individual prices, what's in there for this item, what's in there for that item, you know, in terms of construction. Yeah. Probably, yeah. So, yeah. The more problematic thing was probably the, the plan basically said we've gone through this and it makes sense for the town, but we're not sure about developers, which just reinforces the... Yeah, and you've seen my issues, which I think yeah. are even more fundamental. So, yeah. you know, then I have no... With, with the suggestions I made for some of the key... What I thought were the key things that were wrong originally in the plan, they've been, they've been pretty much correct and everything else. I have no problem with the words. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think based on this discussion, and, and I'm, I'm just going to say, whatever the master plan will be done, we can declare it done at a certain point and just say this is it. I mean, at some point we, we can't, I mean, it cannot be, I mean, it's like, a, you know, at some point you're done, right? Someone could write the same novel their whole life, but at some point you give it to the publisher, right? So, I mean, at some point, I mean, I agree with you, Gus, that if there's no, if the financial model is not in there, or the zoning is not in there, then it's not done. But I mean, I think it's. Here, I mean, I, I totally agree with your sentiment, except that if the finances are not there, if we have a fatal financial profile, then we're done. We're, well, the whole thing's but, done. But I mean, so, part of the RFA time, process. Time. I don't think there's any intent to actually publish the financial model. But the numbers that are in the plan now reflect 
the num I mean, I went through, I mean, with my limited abilities, I've gone through the spreadsheets, and if it says $20 million in the master plan, there's a spreadsheet that shows $20 million. So as far as the text and, the, and what's in there, it's, it's there. So you're not going to see, I don't think, in any published form, the financial model. I don't think there's anything most people could do with it anyway, quite frankly. Uh, it's, it's 40 pages or 50 pages of, of Excel spreadsheets. And the reality is what we're trying to get out of the RFI process is, is if I, the people who are responding to the RFI aren't really going to need our financial model. No. Because ideally, these are people who do this. They're going to look at what we want to do, and they're going to have their own analysis of what this is, right? So yeah. in terms of having the model finished, given that we, we contemplate the possibility of adjusting the plan, adjusting the zoning, adjusting the rest of it after this RFI process, I think the level of completion that we need to go to the RFI process is not the same as it would be if we were going to the town meeting and saying, we are endorsing this master plan, we are endorsing the zoning, we want you to do it. I agree with you that if you're at that point, you need to have a financial model that we have confidence in to say, we think this is a realistic estimate of the cost. But part of what we're trying to get from the RFI process is input from developers to say, uh, I think this would cost X amount. Right? Let, me, let me give you the specific thing that's on my mind. In, in the draft uh, master plan, there's a, two things. There's this comment that says, we've gone through it, and it looks like it makes sense for the town. We're not so sure about developers. So that's the first warning for me. Uh, the second one is when we do get into the infrastructure issues, there's comments in the draft plan that say we would expect the developer to contribute to the infrastructure but we know that they're not going to absorb the infrastructure. And then we have a number, and I won't even throw it out here in public because it may have changed. But we have a pretty serious number for what the town would have to kick in by way of infrastructure cost. I'd kind of like to know what the assumption is that we're making when we say this is what the town has to kick in. I'd kind of like to know what the assumption is about what we think the developers are kicking in. So when we put that RFI out, they get this message that says the town is expecting you're going to kick in this kind of contribution for infrastructure and I the developers even, and come back to us and say yes or no. Why would we even tell them that? Uh, well, I mean, because I mean, somewhere along the way, the developer, what I've, maybe we don't tell them that, but we need to ask them the question in a way that allows us to hear back from them what they see as the finances so that we understand the implications. Right, but I don't think we need, we don't need to give that, I mean, the, the, it'll be public what's in the plan, so they can mm -hmm. look at what the assumptions are in the plan. Mm -hmm. But, again, if, if they're going to be relying on our financial model, they're not going to have a lot to contribute in responding to the RFI. And what we want them to say is, here's how we analyze this project, here's how we look at this. If I were bidding on this kind of a project, I would expect the town contribution to be X, or I would do this, or I would do that. I mean, that's kind of the feedback I, I would think we're trying to get. I mean, I don't think we're going to tell them, hey, we're going to give you X millions of dollars, mm -hmm. you like that, or you need more, or do you need less? I think we want to say, look, if this is what we're trying to achieve, the end goal is this master plan, is this layout, something like this, this mix of uses, this layout, this use of the buildings, is how would you get there? Yeah, is right? it going to fly? Do we need to change it? Is it going to mm -hmm. fly? Not is it going to fly if you accept our financial model, if you accept these contributions, if you, you know, th that piece of it, mm -hmm. that's kind of where the developers come in. Right? That's their kind of expertise I, I, and knowledge is to say, here's how we figure out how to do these things. I mean, aren't you looking for them to do their own financial yes, model? I mean, our financial saying. model of what our consultant says a developer needs to see or what a developer is going to have to spend or how much money the developer is going to have to make doesn't mean anything until you get a response back from the developer. So, so there's we, enough so, general so I, information. I hear, you. I hear you, but here's my question. What guidance does the developer get around our expectations around infrastructure? Because well, if we get, if the developer... No, no, wait, no, wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry, Gus. Yeah. Let me... Go ahead. There's a whole section in there on financing. There's a whole section in the, in the master plan on town financing. There's, there's DIF and TIF funding and everything else. And there's, there's a, a, a several pages on things that the town should consider or might be willing to consider to look at to, to kick in, essentially, into the infrastructure costs. That's in there. And I think what you'd be looking for is a response back from the developer that says, that's not enough. 
or no, I need 700 units instead of whatever you guys think you want or anything or else. Or if I mean, we did it differently, okay. we, you would contribute less. Right. right. In other words, the town contribution would be less to that if we did A, B, or C, or we did it this way or did it that way, or I have this clever way of doing sewers that you, know, you haven't thought of that I can do because I'm a sewer genius. Or and, and the whole issue is, of right? phasing is still in there, too, in terms of what it costs over if, if you do phasing. So, I mean, that hasn't been really looked at. But you, cause you, you need a, you, I, I agree you need a response of some kind from the market to, 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 to give you an idea where you're going. What, what I'm getting at is I wouldn't want a developer to make an assumption that the town expects them to absorb all of the infrastructure costs and therefore comes in and says, you need 600 units because no. it's, it's working off the wrong assumption. No, I don't think that's right. in the Maybe plan. There, I don't think the right. plan's written that way to say that. I mean, I think, I think it's trying, we're trying to. In the RFI, to, wouldn't we ask? In responding to the RFI, what would you expect to be in terms of public dollar contributions? What would you expect? To, I mean, that's part right. of what we asked for, right? I mean, this, that's this, this form incidentally oh. does not accomplish that. What? This form, you know, in all due respect to the time and effort, is, is not, this is geared towards identifying a potential developer. Yeah. As yeah. I, I, I wasn't, you know, this is not a true draft. What I was getting at is, right. if you want to know what an RFI looks like, in terms of trying to think there about is what it no, takes for one together. There is no legal requirements, okay? 30B, Section 16, when you get to RFP, that's legal requirements. And I gave you, as uh, informational tonight, a guidance from the Inspector General's Office out of Revere that analyzed where some deficiencies with a project up in Revere. Whatever you do beforehand, you're free to do whatever you want. And, and the kind of questions that you're ri raising, the kind of information you're looking for, perfectly permissible, and it can be done as simply as possible. You don't want developers to have to spend a lot of time and effort because they're not going to respond under those things. I agree with all that. This is not an issue of legal compliance. This is an issue of you're going to ask the question, what do you have to put together to ask the question? This, and the only point about this is here's a five, you know, I, I had heard it's two pages, and then I got a draft and it's one's five pages, and now I understand. I know, we wouldn't put in this what this has in it as the draft, but at least it gives you a sense of what one of these would look like. It's going to be something like this. The town's done, conducted a master plan for redevelopment of this property. This is, these are the uh, cogent elements, or you can say where it is, and here are the options and all. Uh, we are looking for an expression of in, uh, interest or uh, what shortcomings you see or what kind of contribution you would want or whatever questions you want to pose. And that's what you're going to get back, the kind of information that you were kicking around here a minute ago. Right, because, because to a certain extent, right, the RFI process is it's not a replacement for it, but it was an, it's another way to have gotten at what their financial model was trying to achieve, right? You, you could have done the master plan without the financial model and then issued an RFI with the master plan to developers and asking questions about what it would cost and all those sort of things. Right. We, we, we've developed, I think, because the RFI was not part of the plan until recently, they developed this financial model because it's supposed to be a full package, right? I think the financial model is, is not necessary to the RFI. Where it's going to be necessary, again, is on the back end when, if we do, we're, both of them are presenting to the special town meeting and eventually evaluating RFPs, that if we like the model and we think it's an appropriate model, that'll be one of the criteria for evaluating our disposition is how it plays against the financial model. There's, there's one reason to, to, to do the financial model, if only to determine what's the value of the property, what does the town get for the property when it sells it, and what are the impacts of the development on the town. So essentially, you have, you have to come up with some kind of a pro forma right. that says this is the plan we're going forward with. And I think what the, what the committee was looking to do was to, having surveyed the public, having come up with the general impression that a huge development of thousands of units was not what anybody wanted, what was the closest number to what the town had expressed they'd like to see for units? And what was that impact on a developer? And then determine what are the town costs that are going to come from that development and everything else and see what, what the revenue stream would be. I mean, right. so the, the model essentially was, was built to develop a revenue stream to the town and also the attractiveness of the, of the plan to, to develop. Right. Right. And re right. Really, for the RFI, we're asking the attractiveness question. It's up to us to evaluate the cost of the town question based on what, what it ends up being. So all I'm saying is we don't need to have the financial model tweaked to perfection in order to issue the RFI. 
because it may be that some of the responses we get to the RFI will cause us to tweak some of the inputs or some of the ways that the right. financial model works in terms of our evaluation of plans. So. Yep. Okay. So then, um, do you think it would be realistic to target September 18th, which would be our second meeting in September, for the issuance of the RFI? I would like to know the date of the final master plan. How much time do you need from the time the master planning committee says th this is it, we're done, we're finished, until we issue the four, RFI? I would think if we have the development committee in place, because they'll be issuing it two to four weeks. That's two it. to four weeks. Yeah. So in other words, if we create the development committee on the 21st, and if we have the master plan by the 21st, mm -hmm. then we can issue the RFI on the 18th. 21st of August. Yeah. Pete, do you agree with that? Can we tell uh, yeah. the mass planning committee we'd Absolutely. like to have them done? Just tell them wh whatever it looks like on the 21st. <laughs> <laughs> what it is is what it is. Right. I mean, um, and on the 18th, we're going to issue the RFI. September 18th, we'll issue the RFI. The development committee will meet between the 21st and the 18th to develop the RFI, um, depending on everybody's schedules. Obviously, the last school is just heading back into session, so people should be coming back home. So it should be doable for, and again, as I, I think you're right, Gus, it's not going to take 30 meetings to develop this right, RFI. Right. All right, so we issue the RFI. We probably have to give people, oh, my phone is shut off, my calendar was open. Um, we've got to give people at least a month. Mm -hmm. And so we Mark, would Mark, is that the what time you guys usually uh, give people to respond to an RFI? What? How much time do you usually give people to respond to an RFI? Well, let's ask at least that because if you don't, they, you don't get any, you don't get a response. At least so, a month. Yeah, and got the all development the committee will have to advise on it. So I think the okay. development committee will advise on the time. So I think we leave. Peter had issuing the RFI like July nineteenth, and proposals due to August twenty ninth. Yeah, five weeks. Yeah, five, five, six weeks. Four to six weeks is fair. Four to six, six, six weeks. All right. Well, let, let, let's be. Thank you. Conservative about it, make it six weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's the 18th. So let's see, that's one, End two, of October. three, four, five. Six weeks is October 30th. So we make 1030 okay. is return date on RFI. Okay. RFI. All right. So then we get the RFI comes in. The development committee meets in November. Um, I think we th we're then looking at scheduling probably the Board of Selectmen's meetings around deciding what to do in December, right? Give the, give the development committee a month with the responses. Mm -hmm. It probably makes sense, right? And I don't think we need to send, you know, specific dates for this, but we should pick a date. And we say December, by December 18th, we will decide what we're going to do. So responses are come in by... October 30th. October 30th. Why would, uh, and those are feedback. Yeah, that's probably, that's probably right, Mike, because okay. if we get feedback and we have to change things, it's going to take, yeah. Right. And now look, if, if, if the feedback is such that we, we may be deciding on December 18th we need sort of radical surgery, mm -hmm. in which case all bets are off, right? Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. then assuming... Sarah, back to your calendar. I'm sorry I told you you could leave. <laughs> now you're having to stick around. I apologize. So l let's say optimistically on December 18th, the Board of Selectmen decides this is the master plan, this is the zoning. What does the planning board schedule look like from there on out? Pretty clear. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> December 25th, the planning board shall meet. You don't have any major projects? For annual town meeting, because now you're getting into an overlap with preparing for annual. So we have a mm -hmm. couple of minor um, zoning I would, I would, changes. I would categorize them as minor, but we'll see. Um, zoning changes for annual, and um, but this would be a special, so we'd have our own set of public hearings. Um, would it have to be that? a special if we're if we're doing this in December, and we're going through the zoning process in January, February? It's probably a policy decision on your part um, where. So we can uh, decide that. But I'm just we sitting there, a special town meeting in March and then an annual town meeting in April versus. It's such so. a lightning rod that it'll overpower. Yeah. Well, but we can, we can figure that piece out. Right. right. Which we have done in the past, but right, yeah. you're right. So yeah. I, I think could, could we conceivably, if, if we decided on the 18th what we were going to do, mm -hmm. we being the Board of Selectmen, have a special town meeting on the second Monday in March? Yes. Okay. The, from a planning um, board, from a planning board issue perspective. issue with the. Planning board timeline is the newspaper requires basically a month right. for 
well, for statute and then the lead mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. to get it in there. And then um, the planning board can hold back to back maybe every other week mm -hmm. um, public hearings depending on um, how intense that review is. And the other factor is uh, how much in advance you need the final draft form of the zoning amendment, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's uh, a s for annual, I know you like it six weeks in advance, but with for a special, you might have shorter right. timing. But it, it sounds like if, if, if we were just, again, if, 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 this, if we would decide to go the route of the special, which we don't have to decide now, but I mean, I, I think our, our working assumption has always been, even when we were talking about a, a town meeting this past spring, it would be a special in May or mm -hmm. right after yeah. the, and I, mean, and, and I certainly lean in that direction just given the size of the decision and all that, but, but we can decide that down the road. Mm -hmm. At least we wouldn't be taking it off the table. Right. Right. Yeah, so it's December March. 18th, as we'd get it right into the paper, so it could be um, advertising over... Christmas, New Year, <laughs> <laughs> but this wouldn't be a surprise to anybody. Right. You know, this is right. what we've been working on for a very long time. So we could do a March 11th, a March 4th, something like that, town meeting, and meet all the deadlines. The warrant report would have to go out in February, mm -hmm. 30 days in advance, right? Let's go out. What? No, right? Uh, no, for a special. No, for a special. For, there's no requirement for a report at all. No. That's no. just for the annual. No, but I mean the warrant. You're supposed to warrant 30 days before a special, don't you? No. No, no, it's less than 30 days oh. for a special. Right. 14 days. Oh, it's 14, 14 days, and it's All right. seven for the annual. We did this on the uh, water tower we, on the land. Uh, we did okay. this on the, uh, mm -hmm. I think, on the uh, purchase of the property, too. Yeah. All right. So tentatively, then, we could do a, a March special time meeting. If we didn't hit that, we'd be back into a May special time meeting if we decided to do a special as opposed to rolling it into the annual on April 29th. All right. Well, we have we have a schedule and we have a plan. Could you repeat? Time <laughs> <the schedule>? <laughs> <laughs> just, just show up here every Tuesday from now until next week. <laughs> <laughs> All right, August fourteenth. Um, resumes due. Resumes due. August twenty first. Committee created. Um, master plan due. Master plan due. August twenty first. Master plan with appendices and codicils and corollaries and footnotes and exhibits and additions <laughs> and epilogues and sequels and everything. August 21st, the full thing due. We'll on the website, 822. August, <laughs> August 21st. Uh, September 18th, issue the RFI, 1030, uh, return date for the RFI. Um, and then we likely will have multiple interim meetings between now and then, but the idea being we're going to sort of Fisher cut bait on December 18th okay. um, to push to decide here's what we're going to put forward to a special or an annual in the zoning. This is the Board of Selectmen's plan for the hospital. I have a couple of questions. I know that there are uh, two touch points that the State Hospital Master Planning Committee was interested in um, uh, Medfield Day, September 15th, and also having a public meeting to present the master plan. I don't need an answer now. I just wanted to make sure that you were aware that those um, ideas had been floating out there um, so that if you need somebody to be out there, they can be. Appreciate yeah. that. The, um, yeah. the, I'll tell you about the Medfield Day booth. So it's something that we do every year um, as a way to sort of publicis, pub, publicize. Publicize. Um, it, yes. And... Um, so it's something that I would seriously consider, but it also requires having the volunteers demand the booth uh, throughout the day. It might be something that the community members are looking for. Your committee may want to get, if you form your RFI committee, that might be something that they could address at the booth as well. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if that committee gets formed on August 21st, the idea that they're going to talk knowledgeably about the details or master plan yeah. three weeks later yeah. is not. But on the other hand, the idea of transferring knowledge to the new committee, uh, that might be a nice, that might actually Overlap. be a nice way to do it. Right. Yeah. And I mean, one thing we do have to, I don't know if anyone would be interested, I know there's been some discussion from time to time about whether anybody from the master planning committee should also be on this development right. committee. So there needs to be some way of having the knowledge of the master planning committee available to this committee for sure. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I know a couple of people potentially were interested and others were not. So, I don't, I don't know if, if the numbers of interested people has dwindled <laughs> since that last <laughs> discussion. But that's something to think about for mm -hmm. the for the 14th. And, and Sarah, if they're meeting tomorrow night, I think you should 
raise with them to see if any of them are interested, they should contact one of us. Oh, they talk about that. Yeah, yes. and let, let, let. The, the key to me is that this is, that's a liaison to pass this on to people who are developing it. This is not half of a committee continuing on. Sure. That. And that's, it's just, it's a different job. Yep. Mm -hmm. need to be clear on that. Okay. okay. Sarah, thank, thank you. you. I'm sorry to keep you over. Um, let's see. So we have, we don't have a draft capital budget committee charter, so we can cross that one off the list. Um, the financial policy, um, I have some questions and comments. We can discuss it next time as well. Hey, well, just um, in the interest of passing this out, let me give you what I find it. You had voted at the last meeting you were going to sign the financial? Yep. Right. Sign that? Yeah, okay. we'll sign that, yeah. So, so we approved it the last minute. Yeah. So as far as the policy goes, that's done. done. So when you kept it on here, I assumed it's you were looking for the yeah, update on this. Yeah, I have comments on this, on okay. this one. Yeah, yeah. So um, I had asked, so, so uh, actually, uh, that one, that's as good as any other. This is the financial this policy. Is, uh, hold on, send that one back to me. That's, that's fine. I knew there was something wrong. Send these two down. Um, this, is my, this is a minor update. I had asked Mike before his most recent hospital visit to vet this against the enterprise fund. So there still is a question in my mind of whether we have to figure out some way to account for the enterprise fund, but just so you know what you've got. The things that I put in yellow, highlighted in yellow on this, are the are the comments that came out of yes last our last meeting. So they're mechanical updates. Um, and that, it'll take you all of 30 seconds to see what I did. So okay. the issue is to have Mike comment on whether this looks good or not. That's it. All right. And then I can circulate this to the financial team and to yep. the school department for mm -hmm. their, their comment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so I had a few, just a few questions mm -hmm. that were going over it. So the first one is, um, and I don't know if this is answered in this, is in the math. In, in terms of kind of future growth on specific directed overrides, are we going to treat that differently or does that just get treated as new growth? generally uh, up here. Uh, uh, this, this one, the dedicated operating overrides line? Well, I, I, was, I was assuming that was... That grows two and a half percent a year. Right. But I was assuming that that was a reference to like the municipal stabilization fund. Yes. I was talking about in terms of... No, uh, this is, no, this is the maintenance fund. This is the new kind of override. Yeah, the municipal stabilization fund, the municipal building capital stabilization fund. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. 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 I was talking about with respect to ordinary operating overrides, but that come out of this process... You, know, you, was, you come through the so process and you have you have a need it for the school side. So yeah. So here's what I did on this: is up top on that front page, you'll see there's planned new debt overrides, planned new operating overrides, planned new capital overrides. Yep, so got if it. going into this, we looked at a situation and said, listen, this is the year. It's not re in this year might have been an example. We would have said, you know, with the growth in the in the town and school employee budgets, we actually are planning that we're going to need an operating override to cover that, and we would have built it in there right. as part of the project. So it's still going to show up as a recommendation to voters, whether right. they right. go right. along with it or not. But when we, we build that in, um, yeah, it'll show it. That's My basically question was more picky than that. So okay. that, that I got. Okay. I meant, so for example, year one, you have an override. Let's say it's a $500,000, like the ALS override, for example. Yep. So ALS overrides 250 is for, yep. the, for the fire department. Mm -hmm. In year two after that override, yep. do we treat the 2.5% growth in that 250 differently than everything else, or do we just kind of bang it? No, that's there? because that was a normal operating override. I understand so, yeah. that. But I, so, my, no, that my just, question is when, given the, the way that this, cha to the extent this changes anything, mm -hmm. I could see school side saying, look, we had a $2 million override last year. People approved it. It was for us. Mm -hmm. We should also get the two and a half percent on that two million. We should yeah. just no. That's, it that's gets, not, it it gets, because because the issue here is to keep the balance between the two. So you, you, if you were doing yeah, that's you, the you question. Know, yeah, I mean, it's yeah, not. I mean, no, it's a, and, and, a minor. And, no, I, I get I get the question. Uh, and if that were all true, then we'd have to go back ten years to talk about all the other years. That well, but that we, we, so we're, we're starting afresh yeah. from this anyway. Yeah. But, but so I, no, I, I, it, yeah. it all folds. It all folds into an override. That override grows at two and a half percent. Okay. The way anyway. Yep. All right. Um, Sixty-five thirty-five. We can discuss that further. Um, oh, how do we account for department-specific revenue? Within the in it's in the revenue side. So at this level. 
to like the, yeah, the you, revolving I, funds. Yeah, and, I mean, I, I'm trusting Mike to tell me if I left anything out grants. here. Okay. The, the issue, fine. the issue with the enterprise fund is that actually, uh, I think I had it in here, or maybe I didn't. Uh, I guess I didn't list it, but there's a transfer from the water and sewer enterprise funds to the town departments. Mm -hmm. I think I put that under the other revenues, other revenues on this right. thing. Yep. Uh, but that, then that got me into questions around, do you really have to account for the entire enterprise fund? Might have to have another column over there that gives the enterprise fund accounting if that's where we need to go with it. Um, and then the other question I had was, do we do anything different with, with shared services? So like someone like Jerry McCarty, who currently his salary is split right between town and schools. 85% yeah. from the schools and 15 from the Right, or like IT. You know, this, uh, do we treat those differently, or do we just continue to have some sort of a negotiated? The, the bu their budgets show up on both sides, though, right? They get so there's an agreement about how somebody's salary gets distributed, but that then get that shows up on the operating budget for that department or that. The so it's gonna, it's just gonna show up on the town. It'll show up the same way it's showing up now. Okay. And part of it will be on split. the school side, okay. part of it on the operating side. Yeah. Um, and then there's just sort of a more general question, just to kind of how do we make sure that we're not um, unnecessarily increasing budgets, right? In other words, if we do it this way, just making sure we're still having, like for example, the DPW oh. budget went down this year, mm -hmm. right? Year over year, actually, not not like fake government down where it just mm -hmm. grew at a lower rate, like real down, like mm -hmm. real dollars lower. You know, I don't want to you know, well eliminate um, the possibility of of, of, of that happening. So the way I would expect that to work on the town side, because the warrant committee still exists, mm -hmm. so the so the town would still present budgets. They, they, I mean, both schools in town would present budgets to the warrant committee, but the mm -hmm. warrant committee, in particular, digs into the town budgets mm -hmm. in a more assertive way than it does in the school budget. Mm -hmm. uh, so if that kind of a situation occurred, we'd expect this warrant committee. To push the town departments to reduce, mm -hmm. and what then would happen is that down at the bottom there, where I have the unused or excess mm -hmm. allocated levy limit, mm -hmm. you'd have the warrant committee working with the town departments to deliver um, an amount of unused levy limit on the town side, which then could be transferred or vice versa. If, right. if right. we have a month right. of Sundays or something. Right. All right, uh, Pete. Anything else from you on this? No. All right. Great. No. Um, all right. Selectman goals. Gus, you were going to... I do. Yes, I even got right. that. I, you know, I just got back from vacation this weekend, but I was busy over the last <laughs> few days. Uh, so here's, here's what I did with the goals. I, uh, and I guess I'll start with my editorial reactions, because you guys had goals that you handed out. Uh, and what I did was I took the goals that you handed out and went through, the, tried to map them onto this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the way this is mapped here, you'll see there's there's kind of like a magenta, a yellow, and a and a blue. Mike, mm -hmm. you're blue. Pete, you're the magenta. I'm the yellow. Uh, they were all light colors for highlighting, but they came out kind of dark. Um, what I did is I took all of your your comments, tried to map them into this framework, mm -hmm. and to start with, I'm going to ask you to go all the way back to the back to the last two pages. Um, so you guys can slam back at me here if you don't like what I have to say, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a couple comments about some of the things we have here. Uh, two, some of the actions that we have here are actions, they're not goals. Some of the actions are simply actions and it's not clear what their purpose is. Uh, and all of these things that are on the last two pages were actions that we called out, that were called out on the list that actually didn't that I, I was not able to relate back to the goals that we have in this framework. So many of them, there's nothing wrong with the actions. The right-hand comment side is my comments to a few things. Uh, but in many of these things, for one thing, many of them were actions that we were asking, and, and Pete, it was mostly yours, uh, were actions that you were directing at town departments. Or, or else you were directing at town departments through the town administrator. There's nothing wrong with those actions. I'm just saying that from a planning standpoint around goals, they weren't goals, they were just actions. Uh, and I couldn't map them. So I, I may just not have done a good enough job mapping them, but my quick reaction would be I would get rid of all the, the actions on the last few pages 
I'll just drop them from the list because I don't think they really are planning goals. I think they're, they're actions. The other ones, some of the things, the other reaction I had going through these is then of the ones that I could map on as goals, we can do it now or we can do it later. Not all of these are goals that I'm convinced we all three are in agreement on. So the planning process can't be a, a way of getting a decision made that wasn't a decision just by putting it on the actual list. And I think we have some discussions around some of the things that are in here on that. That's just, that's just the personal reaction to what was there. Um, so I don't know if you want to you want to reflect on this, see what I did, and then pick this up in our next meeting to actually go through in detail, or I can go through in detail on this now. Uh, the one thing I didn't do anything that's not highlighted in the 2018-19 goals. Those were the those were the goals that I had mapped on previously. That that when when I put this thing back together again. They were already there. So in some cases, the actions that you all called out on the list that you had provided at our last meeting, there's a couple places where they're almost restatements of what was already in there. I just, for purposes of kind of keeping track of what you did, I, I, I wrote them in again, and then we can clean up the list, if that makes sense. And for those that have a different colored font but aren't highlighted, that's just an artifact of the old version. That doesn't mean anything. So I, I, mean, I think the, the goal of the goals process was to, if we could, kind of agree on a set of goals, mm -hmm. right? So I think mm -hmm. that was what we're hoping to achieve by mm -hmm. it. I, I would have been surprised if we all had identical lists to, yeah. Yeah. to begin with. I mean, I think... Um, I guess I don't have an objection to having, maybe we need two lists, but I don't, I don't have um, an objection to having measurable actual actions listed among the goals. You well, know, they like, don't relate to anything, though. Is what I'm, in other words, when we went through this thing to come up with these goals, the whole point was focus. So if these were the, it, it's, it's possible that there's actions that don't fit on this, and we say, you know what, we missed a really important broad goal that we need to be worried about. Uh, which is fine. But right now, if these were the broad goals, the first two columns were the broad goals, and the, and the major five areas are what we're focused on, the point that I made is, in, as I interpreted it, the items that are on the last two pages have nothing to do with anything that we said were the important focus areas. So it's, it's kind of a, it's got to do with maintaining focus. It's not, I'm not saying all these are bad actions even. It's just that they're not part of a planning process. They're just a to-do list. And in some cases, it's, it's a to-do list of what we want other people to do. It's not even really what, right. what our Well, well so is. I would say, for example, like, I mean, yes, I mean, hiring a town administrator is not a strategic goal. Right. It's obviously something we have to do, right? Yeah. Hiring a police chief is something we have to do yeah. and try to accomplish. Yeah. Now, maybe those are easy things to do and we don't need to worry about them, and so it's not worth writing down. You know, for example, yeah. in some of these things, like converting the town clerk to permanent appointed position, that's a financial issue. Right, we're going to save money by doing that in the long run, and so Why? I mean, to the, because it's going to be a part-time position associated with another job. It's not going to be a full-time full salary clerk? position. Yeah, uh, it's not a full-time position. Um, that's the first I've heard of that. <laughs> You've probably heard me say it five times, but I haven't heard you say it five times. Yeah, I, I don't think it's a full-time position necessarily in 2019. You know, and with the oh. town clerk getting close to retirement, I think it's one of those jobs but, you can look at and say, is, is this the best well, use of $71,000 worth of salary and, yeah, and benefit yeah. in the long run? And well, again, maybe we point. say, well, yes, it is, and it is full-time, and that's why we discussed the goals. But, and even if you're going to keep it as a full-time position, you have greater flexibility if it's an appointed position, not an elected position. Because an elected position, you've got to find somebody who lives in Medfield who wants to run for office, right. which is hard to find. And while it may be a full-time, may not be a part-time, it is a job you have to be able to fill. And so given potential concerns mm -hmm. in the future, it's the only full-time job that's an elected official in Medfield. I think we're in better shape in the long run if we can appoint a town clerk rather than... Uh, yeah, I mean, we were, on, we were on board with that concept from a, from a management standpoint. Right. Right? If this is a financial move... That's news to me, and then I can see maybe you can map it somewhere here. It might that, be, that it might not be, okay. right? I mean, right, right. I mean, I guess you could have goal six, 
effectively manage the government of the town of Medfield, right? And then hiring a good town administrator, thinking about how you're going to reorganize personnel, thinking about how many employees we should have. I mean, all of those are important things to, to think about that might not map onto what I thought right. were sort of strategic goals as opposed to kind right. of our role of managing the town government. So I would suggest that we take Gus's uh, rework of this and just digest it yeah. and, and come back to it yeah. at, the, at our next meeting. Yeah. That would be my recommendation. But I don't have a problem with looking at it this yeah. way. Yeah. And yeah. I'd be happy to try to map these back onto the other goals. If, they, if I didn't realize we were restricted just to our strategic Well, that's the whole point. That was the whole goal. point. <laughs> Otherwise, you're just kind of picking stuff out. The, in fairness, the I things, mean, we didn't things pick like, out hiring a town like, administrator. That's the thing we well, actually no, have to do. In, in fair, and it's yeah, more and, important. And than I, do we really need to plan that? that? It's like no, I, but I think it's so important. Obvious. Just as we've seen with the hospital process, it's important to try to give ourselves some process guidelines on what we're going to do. And so, if we're going to follow that kind of a process, you can actually so get to a completion, completing what you're. So what you're and, and so, in that in that particular one, in the context of that, I wasn't sure why. I think it was one October. To me, it's one December. It's yeah. no no problem with getting it done early, but it's like I wasn't sure why we were suddenly. Yeah, that seemed like an ex overly aggressive three month overlap. So I, uh, so I I base that on the schedule that the town of Lexington is using to hire their town administrator which is a July to October process. And we're a third of the size of Lexington. We should be able to do it in a shorter period of time and not have... See, I was trying to save money because I didn't want to pay for two town administrators for three months. Well... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, just digest yeah. it. It's, I mean, that's, it's where that, yeah. that's where that came from. So. <laughs> but I do think on some of these things, we should give ourselves some deadline for doing them. All right. What's next? I lost my agenda with my numbers on it. Um, all right, selectman goals, hospital, boom, boom, boom. Okay, we're on to anime. Is I, I'm going to declare that anime is not coming. <laughs> we'll, Looks like it. But um, all right, Jerry McCarty, facilities director, requests selectman to sign two-year contract with Select Energy. I looked at this contract. Um, I had many of the same issues with it that we had the last one we looked at. Mark, you need to look at it. I mean, the way this is put together, it has a bunch of terms and conditions associated with the, with the bid mm -hmm. that are not acceptable, including indemnification, arbitration, yeah, right. all the rest of it. So we got to make clear in that contract that we're, we're not approving it with those terms and conditions. I mean, it's like a $3,000 contract, but... Well, I had, I had a question. Is it one or two contracts? Because there's two... I don't know. I haven't seen it. Okay. Yeah. So, so in the material... It's a renewal. It's a renewal. You looked at it? In the materials... Is that, that what I looked at last <laughs> week? <laughs> in the, so for, if you... In the materials that we got... There are two duplicate packages from uh, the, the company what, and for two different locations, 146 North Street and, mm -hmm. and so, and they have different contract numbers. Yes. So there's actually two contracts or else there's one contract that incorporates two proposals, I don't know which, but uh, it's actually Multiple two. Multiple sites, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, and then the other question I had was, are we okay with this? I'd never heard of a company called Case Closed. Yeah, as no, a, no you, you, we're not even. We wouldn't even agree to arbitration. Okay. So I'm just okay. going to reiterate my request right. not ready for from the last time that when we get a contract that has an Exhibit A on it, right. there's something that's stamped Exhibit A, and right. anything that's not intended to be included in Exhibit A is just removed from it. Right. Well, just I'll I'll, I'll clarify. Reiterate that to town department heads, right. whoever needs to know. If, if there's something that's supposed to be an exhibit yes. to a contract that by the contract is 100% a part of the contract according to the way the contract is written, that if this were adopted this way, we're adopting those terms and conditions incorporated because there's no conflict between that and Exhibit A, um, that it's stamped with Exhibit A and anything like that is taken out of it and we just get the exact contract we're being asked to approve. Right. Yes. I don't know who is responsible for doing that. Christine? <laughs> who is apparently responsible for doing everything. <laughs> so reiterate to department heads, if we want to approve a contract, it, it's got to be what we're being asked to approve, not the standard terms and conditions. We're putting that one off. And I don't know anything about case closed, but it's a good name. Are we signing or not signing? No. Okay. Um, all right, Maurice, Maurice Goulet, DPW Director, requests the sign, selectman to sign Chapter 9 reimbursement for the following project, redesign of Route 109, 30,000, North Street Pazing, Paving three hundred and thirty thousand, Phillips Street Bridge one hundred thousand. So just to be clear, the paperwork I think of that thirty thousand, we're we're approving twelve thousand nine hundred. Of the three thirty, we're approving three hundred three thousand seven sixty two sixty seven, and of the Phillips Street Bridge hundred thousand, it's sixty nine thousand three sixty three. Am I right? Yes. 
Okay, so the, the amounts are the smaller, the, the incremental. All right. So do we have a motion? Uh, I move that we approve Chapter 90 reimbursement for the uh, redesign of Route 109 for 12900 the North Street paving contract for 303762 and the Phillips Street Bridge contract for 69363 as stated in the paperwork that uh, Mo submitted. Second. All in favor? Aye. Yep. All right. Um, re request is authorized Christine Truwire to vote to sign a contract with Community Opportunities Group for ongoing affordable housing specialist services. Yes. Discussion and there is questions? an exhibit A. I did this contract. Uh, but, my, <laughs> but my question is this. Was the statement of work updated or changed? The reason it was in part of that statement of work talked about the early, the early, I don't really care, but mm -hmm. part of that work talked about the early stage stuff that they did was still in the statement of work. So I was just curious, was the statement of work updated or is this just a- This is a, just a, it's the existing a, statement it's of work. A re, it's an extension of the existing contract under the existing state of, statement of work. Okay. Yep. I'm okay with it. Uh, uh, this is the small contract. This will, we will now go out for an R, a full RFP for them. Uh, but this is under the ten thousand dollar threshold. Okay. I have a motion. Okay. I move that we approve the uh, or so actually sign the contract with Community Opportunities Group for the ongoing affordable housing specialist services. Second. All in favor. Aye. Yep. Another request from Christine Truweiler that the selectmen vote to authorize the chairman to sign the license agreement with SSCI for drone testing at Medfield State Hospital. You have, uh, you actually approved this license uh, about two years ago when they started doing drone testing and then the principal left the firm and it's a new principal so I asked them to redo another license agreement um, up there. And they've actually done two days of, of testing under this already. So we've already billed them. Yeah, yeah. Great. We've got actually two separate companies up there doing work. So I move that we approve or sign the license agreement with SSCI for drone testing at Medfield State Hospital. Second. All in favor? Aye. Yep. All right. I will tell you as a small aside, they are going to have to hire a detail officer because when they put the caution tape around where they were doing the drone testing, people walked right up to it, lifted it up, and walked <laughs> it repeatedly. So, um, All they did was park two cars, two in the road, and that nobody's supposed to be driving on anyway. I know. So they're, they're going to, uh, they've been working with the chief on hiring a detail officer to cover that when they are flying. You just need a couple of armed mm. drones to throw some <laughs> missiles down at the feet of the people as they come out from it. That's right. Warning, you maybe participate in the testing if <laughs> you the come in there. That's coming. Um, all right. Um, Sarah Raposa, town planner, requests the selectmen to vote to authorize the chairman to sign a license agreement with DCAM for niche engineering to access the laundry parcel for survey purposes. I move that we uh, sign the license agreement with DCAM for niche engineering to access the laundry panel for survey purposes. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. License and permit consent agenda. Any objections? Uh, nope. Yeah, actually, I have questions on Keith Kerbos. And it, this, these are questions. Uh, maybe, uh, Mark, you might even be able to. Well, first of all, just Thomas Upham House, I assume, understands that. We only own about a third of that lawn. Yeah. And this is that they do this every year. Okay. So, yeah. so my two questions on Keith's request was first, do we know if the neighbors are okay with this block party out in their cul-de-sac? We believe they're being invited to the wedding. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take that as a yes. There's only a few houses um, we believe they're all being invited. Okay. And then the only other question I had, is it in fact okay to authorize people to put furniture out in the road, uh, in a road, in a byway, are we actually legally? Well, it's a cul-de-sac. Well, I know this, yes. but it's still a road. Yeah. So we, we had a basketball hoop discussion on this. I'm, I'm razor-like sharp in my understanding. <laughs> no of permanent chairs in the. So, so they wanted small. to put, so they basically want to take over the cul-de-sac for tables and stuff like that. Which is is there they, any reason why we can't let them do, do that? Any block they, when party. we normally issue so a block party permit, yeah. permit, we do the same. Okay. So. You've answered both my questions. I'm yeah. ready to go. Typically, Motion they would to put approve up the consent agenda. Okay, I second. Okay. You move. Oh, I thought you moved. All those in favor? <laughs> Aye. 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 All right. Uh, acceptance and correction of minutes. I'm sorry, uh, just to follow up on that one, since he's so far in advance. But if he's going to be serving alcohol in there, he's going to need a pull one day. If he's going to serve alcohol on the public way. Okay. Well, I mean, so he far. Just, he even if he's given it, I thought if they gave it away, is it because it's in public way you have to do yes. it? Yes, okay. town property. It okay. was the issue of whether or not this was even possible so they could start looking at other venues. Okay. Oh, that's right. This is a year in advance, yeah. huh? Yeah. 
What if he only serves it on his front lawn and they walk out into the into the way? <laughs> then we'll have them arrested. Right. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, January third, twenty seventeen. Minutes, Gus. You weren't even here yet. I'm not so even here, man. Do I love getting out of work? I had a couple changes that I that I circulated yeah. around, and that's yeah, the, I was the only issues that I so had. So I move that we approve the minutes from January third, twenty seventeen. Second. All in favor? Yep. Aye. With Pete's yes. corrections, as corrected by Pete, February twenty first, twenty seventeen. Pete, anything? Uh, I don't remember. I had a couple on uh, a couple of them, but I don't remember which ones they were. Do you have any corrections? But I, I think I had. I think you sent me the corrections on the twenty first. The email went to both of you at yeah, the same time. I think, I, I, I think we have comments on both. All right. So I move that we approve the minutes uh, for February twenty first, twenty seventeen, as corrected by Pete. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, yep. All right, December 19th, 2017. Uh, I have a major correction uh -oh. to the minutes. Um, in the Town Talk and Griddle Cafe license application, the Griddle Cafe is a breakfast and lunch <laughs> establishment, <laughs> not a breakfast only establishment. They also okay. serve lunch. Oh, I'm yes. sure that's how they were. They did they because they, they said breakfast all No, long. because they said it was going to be Panera <laughs> bread style sandwiches at lunch. I remember it specifically. <laughs> So with that correction, any other corrections right, yeah, to December 19th? Um, just pass that to uh, Christina Evelyn with uh, minor handwritten edits on that page of no consequence, no substance. Thank you. All right, do we have a motion to approve the December 19th minutes? I move that we approve the December 19th minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. Yep. I did not send you uh, April 12th of 2018. I will send those when um, I finish them tomorrow. April 17th, 2018, the only correction I had, I believe, that John Krause of Emerson Road, I think there's only one S at the end of his name. That's correct. Unlike uh, beloved bluegrass singer Allison Krause. <laughs> Any corrections? Guys? I have a number of corrections, and I, this, this one I can send it to you electronically. Can you send it to me? That would be great. Uh, they are all, uh, hold on a minute, let me just make sure. They're all editorial. There was a discussion of the, of the, the uh, reserve fund thing that I, there's a little bit more substantial editorial corrections, and I thought I had, I could be wrong. Uh, oh, I know what, and Mike, this is a question for you. On pay, on, uh, there's a statement, Selectman Marcucci noted moving forward to the town meeting, the article is asking for $100,000, $50,000 design plan, this is the, this is the state hospital uh, funding development article. 50,000 for design plans leading to more grants and 50,000 for RFP leading to land disposition. My only comment is that's not what I understood the second 50,000 was tagged for specifically. What I couldn't remember is whether that's what you said and I just didn't react to it. Uh, so if that's really what you said, then that's fine. Uh, originally, my understanding is we were just giving the 50,000 to the uh, development committee to help accelerate the process to get into disposition, not just simply to fund an RFP. Uh, but it's. I don't remember what I said. Oh, said. Okay. <laughs> I mean, so I, I, it, it seemed correct to me. So. Okay. So in that case, because it's what you said, and that's what you remember. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know that's what I said. I don't remember one way or the other. I think it's. I, you know, that's. You okay. Know. And Wait, I will. <laughs> and Christine, I'll send you the. Thank you. Electronic version of that one. Do we want to hold that uh, off? No, no, it's all, it's not substantive. I all would right. just pass it. So can we have a, yep. a motion to approve? I move, I move that we accept the minutes of April 17th. As corrected. As corrected. Thank Second. You. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Uh, June 12th, 2018. Excellent job keeping track of attendance here, by the way. <laughs> and so I, I had one other spelling correction um, I think Chris McMahon is M-C-M-A-H-O-N, not McMahon. -N. That's correct. Um, and Suzanne Sino, I believe she has two eyes in her. She does have two eyes. I, I have, I didn't, I missed Chris's correction, but I did, I have another electronic version I can send to you. Okay, perfect. Um, you got John Krause right here. I did, that yeah, I did. I did a I did a little bit of heavy editing toward the back um, uh, when I introduced this this financial model. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's not changing the point. It's just rewording it 
to what I really what I really was saying. Uh, so if you want, I can read it to you only because they did a lot of edits to it. Uh, but it's not changing the fundamental point. It's just that there's a lot of editorial to make it a little read, read better. So you want to tell me if you want me to read it. Otherwise, I'll just recommend we pass this uh, as amended. Why don't you read it? Okay. With that kind of um, a build-up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I was, I was hoping to get some interest here. <laughs> Selectman Murby explained to the Warrant Committee that after the override votes on Monday, he feels the town made it clear that they don't need the Warrant Committee to be the fiscal watchdogs for the school budget, not for, not for the town, for the school budget. Uh, he proposed a new method of budget analysis using the, quote, Lexington model, close quote, noting that Millis follows the method already. The new method would split guidance for the town operating budget from the school operating budget during the annual budget planning process. The school committee and school department would be directly responsible for keeping their budget within Prop 2 and a half limits or deciding on any operating override amount they wanted to request. Murphy noted the new method would be more mechanical in nature, but would eliminate the pressures on the warrant committee and the town administration to come up with a unified town operating budget when they don't actually control two-thirds of that budget. So that's the main, it doesn't change what I was getting at, but the wording didn't quite capture that. Um, and then Selectman, two paragraph down, Selectman Marcucci said the voters did what they wanted to do and didn't, doesn't see this as a rejection of the fiscal watchdog role of the Warrant Committee. Mr. Wolf said the vote was due to a fundamental and social economic change as incomes in the town continue to rise. Wolf said he hopes townspeople are asking themselves what kind of a town do we want Medfield to be. Murphy feels the town operating budget and planning process needs to be protected rather than having it be a budgetary counterweight for the school budget. So it was just to make the point clear, that's all. So I, the only thing I would disagree with is I don't no. think I limited the fiscal watchdog to the Warrant Committee. I think it was a discussion of, uh, that it was a rejection of the selectmen, the Warren Committee, and everybody else. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Then, then in that case, that's how I remember that discussion being. Okay, then, I'm, then the S goes back in, so I'll, I'll update that, but I'll send it to you. Yeah. Okay. I know, I know, I said more there, but I think the minutes capture yeah. the thrust of what I said, okay. so I'm not going to change it. So we have a motion to submit as corrected. I move that we accept the uh, April 17th, 8, 2018 minutes as amended. Second. All in favor? Yep. Aye. All right. Minutes are done. Okay. Pending items, the dog hearing confirmed date, August 21st, 2018. Did we do, uh, did we do, did we already did do June 5th? Did June 12th? We, we didn't approve June 12th, but we should have. But we, we did. We approved yeah. uh, April 17th yeah. twice. June 5th. Twice. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, here's June 5th. There you no, go. We, we did the 12th. All right. We're going to do June 5th now. Yeah. June 5th. But they meant to just vote. They meant to vote the... That was June 12th. 12th, not the 17th. You did the yeah. you voted the 17th twice. We did. Yeah. yeah. Oh. And then you did vote June 12th. Okay. I have mine are handwritten, and these are handwritten, so pass them on. It's Do you have a, any corrections, people? In this one. You oh. sent, did you send? No, well, okay. you know, I had the two corrections. I just don't remember which. Ones that right. we have a motion to approve as corrected. I move that we approve the June 5th minutes as uh, as amended. Second. All in favor? Aye. Yep. And do we need to revote the? No. Okay. No, we'll um, dog hearing confirmed October, August 21st. Well, it's, it's it's not actually confirmed. It's scheduled for that date, and that I haven't heard back from either of the lawyers. Okay. So. Uh, town administrator update. Anything. Uh, we're going to do a Chief Meany's uh, retirement party on uh, August 28th at the Public Safety Building from 2 to 6. Okay. See if I can get back, but it's the one day I'm not in town this month. But um, And then the Police Chief Study Committee had their first meeting this evening at 6 o'clock, and they received their quotes, and we voted to recommend um, awarding the contract to BadgeQuest in the amount of $20,795. Um, we would like the selectmen to authorize that work to begin immediately, and we'll have the contract prepared for you for the next meeting. But we're anxious to get started on that for the end of August. So you want us to approve it tonight? Uh, if you could. Moving yeah. ahead, and then we'll yeah. for, okay. subject yeah. to the formal order. I move, I move that we approve the awarding of the uh, contract to BadgeQuest for the police chief search. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Aye. Selectman reports. Pete. The uh, Energy Committee met, and uh, it was the last meeting with actually Jerry McCarty attending. Um, and one of the things that uh, Jerry was asked, actually, if, uh, if, if uh, 
he had any recommendations uh, as part of his leaving, and he, and he did say that it would make sense to him for there to be an extra position, because uh, uh, apparently Jerry was walking around checking to see if the schools were actually cleaned by the custodians. And he said that uh, it would make sense for there to be a, a supervisor and the custodial staff in the school department so that uh, whoever is the facilities manager in the future doesn't actually have to go around and look to see that things are cleaned. And so I think that I sent that recommendation along to uh, the superintendent and, the, uh, and, and to the, uh, Michael LaFrancesca. Why is that not something the principal of a school can I, take? I, uh, well, or you could just take one of the existing uh, uh, custodians in a school and make him the supervisor of the other ones, maybe. And uh, I would I, think I, a prin I, school principal would be the one. I was surprised that Jerry was, was actually the one that was responsible yeah. for doing that. Uh, hmm. uh, okay. The other thing that the Energy Committee, uh, they're, they're still working on the, uh, the street lights. Uh, they're meeting with the consultant, I guess. George Woodbury, who's the LED streetlight wonder in Massachusetts. Well, he's, no, he's multiple states now. He's <laughs> figured out a new business, apparently. Um, so the st LED streetlights are going ahead. Uh, the, the one interesting thing that they mentioned that I thought was, because we they were asking me about what was going on with the state hospital, and so I was bringing them up to date on where the state hospital was, and they expressed an interest to have to have some input into the state hospital in terms of the energy efficiency, they they mentioned the term net zero. Um, so, and actually, there is something in the plan about it being efficient or in some way. They don't use the word net zero. Yeah. Lead L E D. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing uh, is that there was a uh, an ex after our last meeting. I had a call from Bill Harvey about the uh, uh, water and sewer uh, presentation that he did here when we were hearing about the master plan. Mm -hmm. And there ended up being some, some exchange of emails. Uh, Jack Wolf was involved in it, I think. And, well, Jack Wolf, yeah, he made the suggestion that, that instead of doing the study uh, that, that water and sewer was suggesting, Bill Harvey told me that the, the study that he thought needed to be done, I asked him how much it would cost, and he was guessing that it would be over 100, less than 300. Thousand, um, Jack Wolf uh, made the suggestion that uh, maybe we don't need as, as precise a number, and that maybe uh, we could get a good enough number. And so Mo uh, uh, Goulet has agreed to bring the people from the water and sewer together with the master planning people and try to work out a, a good enough number. And we'll see whether or not that gets us anywhere. So. And then we can look at the car wash calendar to pay for it and see if there's any openings in the back of town hall for car washes. In Instead the fall. of just the master giving planning we'll run a car wash for the <laughs> sewer study. Anything else, Pete? No, that's it. Gus. Um, the only, I think, the only item I have is uh, I met with Dick Scalari and Jack Wolf this afternoon to have, or the, at noontime today, to go over the just the early cut on the, uh, survey, the senior housing survey results. Uh, Dick has been doing a lot of the early uh, you know, washing to make sure that the data we got back makes sense. And uh, I think the, it's very, very preliminary in terms of looking at things, but it looks like there is strong interest. A couple of things that I took away from a very superficial discussion is there does seem to be significant interest in senior housing, so we're validating that unsurprisingly. We had, we had a better than a 30% response, so out of the... Uh, you know, one open question around that is, is that a self-selected group of people who are interested in senior housing, or is that, in fact, only 30% representation of a, of a larger group? We haven't quite figured out. We, you know, we'll figure out how to deal with that. Um, the interest is there. There's some interesting demographic differences that, in a sense, aren't surprising, but they, uh, it's nonetheless interesting to see it. Uh, we didn't look in depth about where the locations are. One of the things that I did look at that I was a little encouraged by to the point that we had earlier in the meeting is there are some people who really do need affordable, you know, very reasonable prices for what the housing that they need. But there's a sizable percentage of seniors who need senior housing, but they don't need senior housing that's at the very bottom of the price range. They actually can afford you know, a, a modest price range uh, as long as the housing is the right kind of housing. So that's kind of good news probably from a development standpoint. I think the Hinkley development is going to give us an early test on what the market response is and what can actually be done 
uh, in a way that we hope you know points the way for where we can go from here. So a lot of work to be done, but uh, early early look, we have some good data to work with. That's great. A couple updates from the Affordable Housing Trust Board. Um, after promising the members of the board that we have the summer off, uh, we've met at least every month this whole summer. We're meeting on Thursday. Um, to review a, a proposed uh, LIP project, which is a senior housing uh, proposed LIP project off of Adams Street. Um, it would enter off of Adams Street and essentially be between Adams and the railroad tracks back there. It's a Bob Borelli proposal for 16 uh, senior, basically, they're not cottages, um, sort of duplexes with first floor masters and kind of what do you call it? no step entrances and garages and all that so it would be done as a lip so four of them would be affordable and 12 would be market rate and um, now he puts the estimate in the market rate in the 450 to 550 kind of range mm -hmm. now whether that's where it stays at the end of the day um, who knows but it's 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 on that on the senior center end of it so he had we had some back and forth with him Tim Bonfati has been working with him and he's ready to come in and make a presentation he's had already had a meeting with neighbors and a meeting with the butters um, so it would not be a major contributor to um, to the next uh, safe harbor, and it would be four additional SHI units because it would be for sale. But um, I think it would be a good senior-oriented project. It'll be interesting to see. We'll see the proposal on Thursday. And then, as I alluded to earlier, uh, Tilden Village, the, the Medfield Housing Authority, has reached an agreement with Newgate, which is the name of the company that's going to develop the expansion of Tilden Village. Uh, it was a long process. Uh, Todd Trebenko has been our point person on that. He's worked very hard with the Housing Authority Board and with the um, with the developer to get that lined up. Uh, the Affordable Housing Trust made a $25,000 contribution to pay for the attorneys to represent the housing. The Housing Authority didn't have any money to hire lawyers, so to hire lawyers to represent the Housing Authority in negotiating this. Essentially, at this point, under the agreement, the developer sort of picks up all the work. And so he's in the process of applying to DHCD to get his project, project eligibility letter. Then we'll come back to the town. And then he's also trying to get into the next round of uh, tax credits that are issued by the state mm -hmm. for this, this development. It's still probably, I think, the, the timeline I laid out in the memo that I, I sent uh, us all, you all, a few months ago is probably still correct. It's probably still several years away. But some of it depends, as, as Courtney had mentioned, on whether the lightning strikes with respect to the state money and if the state money comes in then he's off to the races but a very capable guy he was he worked for the company that built the park and now is out on his own um, he did this in Rockland uh, with, with the senior uh, senior housing authority in Rockland and essentially he develops the property and um, receives the the lease revenue for the first 30 years or so and then turns it back over to the Medfield Housing Authority um, but in the meantime um, it would add the 45 additional units there so positive developments yeah. When, he, when he did his uh, presentation, he mentioned that, that you have to go through several cycles of applying for the money yeah. before you actually get it. Yeah. He said so. five years, I think. All right. Um, we need a motion. Well, um, I declare, right? I declare that um, the board needs to go into executive session for, for the purpose of discussing potential litigation strategy for collective bargaining and strategy for contract discussions with non-union personnel and that holding this discussion in a public open session would be to the detriment of the town's litigating and negotiating strategy and the open session will not reconvene after the conclusion of the executive session. So I move that the Medfield Board Selectmen go into executive session for the following purposes to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body and the chair so declares and to discuss strategy with respect to litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares and at the open session Say again and at the oh, open and at the end of the session and uh, that the open session will not reconvene at the conclusion of the executive session I'll second that uh, Roll call. See. Yep. Uh, Selectman Peterson. Yes. Selectman Marcucci. Aye. Selectman Murby. Aye. The preceding was a production of Medfield TV.